um, call this meeting to order. Uh, so thank you all for being here. First thing is to review and approve the agenda. Um, I think there are, are probably no uh, needed changes except that there were two addendums added to the um, consent agenda, but they are posted online. Um, any other changes to the agenda? Okay, so without objection, we'll consider the agenda approved. Um, general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on a matter that is otherwise not on our agenda. And if you would uh, try to keep your comments to two minutes or less, um, and if you would uh, say your name and where you're from, and actually just while I'm saying all of this, just one other note um, to, to ourselves too. Um, since it came up last time, let's try to not interrupt each other or people talking and um, I will in turn also try to hold people to two minutes. So there we go. All right, welcome. Very well. Um, good evening, I'm Zach Hughes, uh, Prospect Street neighborhood in Montpelier. Um, I rise this evening to uh, give congrats or an order for the city of Montpelier along with the partners uh, of Down Street and uh, GMT, uh, Green Mountain Transit, in the opening of the Transit Center and the apartments that will add much needed housing to the city, as well as an easier transport for everyone who needs transportation in and out of the city. I uh, offer congratulations. Um, on a more um, serious topic, I um, I continue to um, follow the uh, events of Mark Johnson's death, and I had a very hard day. We had a hard day today, but uh, we're starting to um, get these events more, and I mean, get these uh, get more information out now. And I think uh, we we're, we're all acknowledging that um, as the information comes out, um, some of it may be shocking for us to see and view and urge that people take care of themselves as we get this information and that we continue to come together and work uh, toward um, uh, better solutions in this situation. I thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, anyone else? Hello, my name is Seth Collins. I live in Berlin, Vermont, and I'll try to keep this under two minutes. I'm sorry if it's lengthy. I, I, um, I compressed it down as much as I could. So I would like to request that Montpelier City Council create the Feminist Neighborhood Watch. In, in my opinion, it would be composed of one representative from each district, and in my opinion, um, each district would be divided up. I mean, I, I don't know how this would work. I mean, I'm just guessing, so I apologize if I make mistakes. But uh, in, in my opinion, each district would be uh, divided up into smaller areas monitored by an individual of that, uh, of that sub-district as, uh, as a single person getting to know an entire di district, in my opinion, would, would be overwhelming. I would also like there to be a gossip network created to relay information to the neighborhood watch and to pool and cross-reference information. I would also like for City Hall to a request from Circle and from the Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence to have weekly anti-predator activism trainings held in downtown Montpelier, and there to be a direct line and protocol for reporting predators and suspected predators to the to the name, uh, sorry, it sounds confusing, but, but uh, all, all I want is there to be a you know direct communication between the the town and or I mean the city or uh, the town and the and the neighborhood watch, and I would like for the gossip network to support the district representative and the sub guardians in getting to know the individuals in each in each district and smaller area, and I would also suggest that there would be a. There would be district-wide events at separate times for the, for the whole district so that the district representative and the district sub-guardians could thus get to know people in, in, uh, in uh, one area. Th thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. 
All right, anyone else? Yeah. Morgan. Morgan Brown, uh, District 3 resident. Just very quickly, I want to second uh, Zach's comments uh, about the Downstreet Housing Project that uh, just got kicked off, and uh, it's great. So, thank you, everyone. It was hard work, and it paid off. And now we're moving forward with what's available, including the housing and and the transportation hub, and that's great. It's good. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Steve Whitaker. Uh, having watched the video, um, I w want to rise in protest that that was an unnecessary shooting. It's clear. Well, he, technically, we may have exonerated the police officers because there's a bright line that any firearm aimed at an officer is creates a justifiable shooting. But this person was clearly distressed, was not aiming at anything. He was brandishing a gun, looking like he's inviting to be shot, suicide by cop. He would have rather jumped into the river, and he could have been allowed to, but our officers shouted him back down rather than let him jump into the river, which at worst case would have broken a leg. We also had the beanbag option, but I believe that went off the record when Jack McCullough asked Bill why do it wasn't used. It's like I could talk to you about that, as if not to create a paper trail. Okay, That's something that should have been created a paper trail. But this was an absolutely unnecessary shooting from a guy who clearly doesn't know how to wield a firearm and from a distance where he couldn't have hit the side of a bus. And we took him out with two fragmentation rifle rounds. So while I'm not questioning the the judgment of exonerating the officer based on the rules we're living in with now, we're better than that. And we need to, we may need to release that cop or do some real intensive training. Because even the chatter between them on the video, it's clear that they didn't perceive him as a threat. Like he couldn't hit them. What's he doing? He's waving that thing around, you know? So there, we didn't stop the car that drove five feet from him as if that person wasn't at risk. So clearly we didn't have control of the situation, but we could have waited for reinforcement, waited for mental health. This was clearly, evidently, a mental health issue with someone trying to either get shot, invite a bullet, or jump into the river. And we could have let him jump into the river or knocked him into the river with a beanbag. So You're at about two minutes right now. Thank you. I'm glad you think that's important. Anyone else? Okay. and. Yeah, uh, Bill. I just want to introduce Cameron Niedermeyer, our new assistant city manager. She was, would have been here last time had she not been ill. Yes, so sorry her about that. Mm -hmm. Nice to stay. And for all future foreseeable needs. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you. All right. Um, so just one note um, um, that I guess I'll add before we move into the, the rest of the meeting. Um, you know, we did have the press conference today about um, – uh, the uh, attorney general's, uh, the state's attorney general's um, findings on um, the the case today, or the the, the case with Mark Johnson, uh, and uh, I just want people to know that we will be having uh, further conversation about um, uh, that topic at the next meeting. We had planned on um, making it an agenda item um, after the um, findings came out, and so we'll be talking more about that um, at our, our following meeting. Um, none the, I mean, we're, you know, on the one hand, um, you know, glad that the officer was exonerated there, but um, off, obviously it's still a very sad situation. So um, just want to remain, you know, sort of conscious and sensitive to, to that. And it's, um, you know, it's still a, a very tough thing. So um, thank you all. And on to our, um, just yes, one sure. thing to that for those that are interested. Um, there is a link on the police department, on our police department mm -hmm. website, now, which, which shows, um, well, our Facebook page shows the full press conference today. So you can hear the comments by um, the state's attorney. And then the police department website link has the releases from uh, both the attorney general and the state's attorney, as well as the videos that Mr. Whitaker uh, 
referred to. So all the inform and the transcripts and other information, I believe the state's attorney is unsealed, will be through the uh, court. I, I want to say the district court. So all the related information is out there. So in advance of the conversation, people can read it and get and watch it and get as informed as they like. Okay, thank you. Um, on to the consent agenda. Um, is there a motion? Oh, um, actually, Crystal, did you want to say something about the consent agenda? Yeah. To remove item B. So we're gonna we're gonna re remove item B and vote on it separately. Yes. Okay. With a correction. Okay, with a correction. Great. Um, is there a motion regarding the consent agenda, or anybody want to pull anything else? Move the consent agenda. I'll second it. And this, just to clarify, this is a consent agenda without item B. Um, further discussion? Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? And is there a motion regarding B um, with the amendments? Or do you want to explain it at all? Or you should have a copy of. Do you want to talk into your mic? Thanks. You should all have a copy of the, um, of the minutes from October 9th. In section 19289, there's just a little typo on there that's being changed. Cool. So yep. I would Don't. make a motion that we accept the minutes as amended. Second. This is the minutes of October 9th. Okay, great. All right, so there's been a motion and a second. Further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. <coughs> So we have a few appointments to make. So the first is the Transportation Infrastructure Committee. So looking at that, there were um, two expiring seats and two vacant seats. Excuse me. And we had two applications um, from folks seeking reappointment. I don't know if uh, Celia or Ian are here. But if you are, I'm guessing not. Uh, okay. Um, is there a motion? Yeah. Well, or a I comment. Would, I will yeah. make a motion, but I would like you to know that they both have been very active and attentive to their position on that committee. Wonderful. And I would make a motion that we appoint Ian Anderson and Cecile Richer. Celia Richer. How do you say your last name? I don't know. I think she pronounced it Rico, but I'm not positive. It looks okay. like Rico. Cecilia Rico, spelled correctly on the <laughs> attachment. You, you want the spelling? It's, it's R I E C H E L as appointments to the interest infrastructure committee. Second. Further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, and uh, all right, so to the um, Homelessness Task Force, um, we have a recent vacancy there, um, and we had two folks um, uh, put their names in for that position. And I, I know I see Morgan here. Um, would you like to introduce yourself to the council? For anybody who might not know me, my name's Morgan W. Brown, and I live in District 3. Um, and uh, I've lived in Montpelier, I believe, uh, 27 years, uh, absent one year midsummer of 96 to midsummer of 97 when I lived in Barton Village up in the Northeast Kingdom. Uh, came back to Montpelier and lived without permanent housing or as most people refer to it, homeless for 12 years and in many of its different forms. Uh, as you can tell, it still touches close. Uh, it was a painful time. Uh, but I'm grateful to have been housed for 10 years now. And I'm seeking appointment to the Homelessness Task Force because I believe I have something to contribute 
along with uh, those others already serving. And uh, I only speak for myself, but I also believe I can speak to uh, certain experiences. And I also have a, a certain skill set and uh, abilities that I've learned over the years, uh, both on the street and off the street. And uh, uh, I've done a lot of advocacy over the years, including when I was living homeless. Um, and I believe that that can help benefit the work of the Homelessness Task Force and all of you as well in the work that you do. So I thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Morgan. Any questions, Morgan? And I don't see Rick here. Um, so is there a motion to go into executive session? Pursuant to 1 BSA section 313A3, I move we enter into an executive session to discuss the appointment of a public official. I'll second that. Further discussion? Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, well, we will be back shortly. Okay, um, is there a motion to come out of executive session? So moved. One of, is there a second? Second, great, okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, and do we have a motion? I move that the council appoint both Morgan Brown and Rick DeAngelis to the Homelessness Task Force. Second. Um, hang on, not right now. Um, uh, is there any further discussion? Um, if you would like to, now would be okay. Uh, I have raised the issue of accountability of Good Sam, and when I first proposed the task force, uh, it was very clear that providers should not be serving on the task force because they will have the effect of um, defending status quo uh, and or steering some of these are very not, not, nothing personal against Rick but I think it's more appropriate for him to be dialoguing with the task force than to be on it uh, Morgan on the other hand is is a true demonstrated advocate but this is too important and good Sam has not been transparent and has not been cooperative even acknowledging the deficiency that your own pastor put in the paper okay so it's inappropriate to put a service provider trying to defend a status quo on on the task force so i would recommend that you amend the motion to being morgan only great right, thank you any further discussion um glenn uh i want to uh first speak just to the fact that we uh um would like to appoint two members despite uh, having advertised for one. Um, both Rick DeAngelis and Morgan Brown have been attending uh, nearly all of the meetings so far. We meet weekly, Wednesdays from 11.30 to 1, um, and both have been uh, extremely helpful and uh, cooperative. Uh, we've also had trouble uh, fielding the full task force during that time, uh, not everyone can always make it. Uh, so uh, it feels like it would be good to have more people um, who are available there. Um, in brief response, personal response anyway, to, to Mr. Whitaker's comments, um, I feel that uh, Rick has been Rick DeAngelis has been clear about his position on the board of Good Sam. Um, and I think that Good Sam as an organization has in fact been uh, extraordinarily cooperative with the city council. Uh, and I don't see an adequate reason to prevent him from serving as he is able to do on the task force. I second the motion if I haven't already. Okay, um, Jack. I, w I also want to point out, say that <coughs> I've known both Morgan and uh, Rick DeAngelis for many years. They're uh, both uh, 
devoted advocates who, uh, uh, Rick's been uh, a housing advocate and in, uh, involved in working for housing in the city of Montpelier and the state for many, many years. Morgan has been uh, an advocate for uh, a range of topics for, for many years. I think they are both uh, valuable additions to, to this task force. And uh, and so I think it they will both be very good and enhance the uh, work of the task force. Um, Zach. Yes, I appreciate that. Um, Zach Hughes again, Prospect Street Neighborhood. Um, I think that I had the same thoughts as Mr. Whitaker at first, um, probably about uh, when I first got word that Rick was going to be appointed, only because it was the... Um, I saw Rick as a, um, did see Rick as a service, um, in a service provider coming over um, from the good Sam. However, um, in having been in the meetings, uh, two, two sets of meetings uh, with Rick, I didn't see anything that would indicate that he would, um, he was, I, I think we walk a fine line because uh, another member of that task force could be seen as a service provider. I'm also a service provider, but I've always identified myself there as a citizen. So there is this thing, and, and that's, I was originally gonna ask what the intent was tonight, but I'm not gonna do that. Instead of let the uh, process flow out, and I can guarantee you, if Rick did cross over a threshold, I'm sure Glenn and myself would come back here and say, that's not what we want to see in here. I, I think very confident in that. And I, I've also known Rick for years, and Rick is also on other boards, um, not just Good Samaritan. So I just want to mention that. Thank you. Right, thank you. Any further discussion? OK. okay. I'm sorry. Um, oh, uh, Larry, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, Lauren Seiler, uh, Abel did on air, as well as uh, uh, an advocate for persons with special needs. Um, I would like to say, you know, I'm I'm glad that you guys are going to appoint Morgan. Uh, Morgan is uh, an extremely uh, hardworking advocate, uh, and as far as Rick uh, a Angelus, um, I know Rick uh, through Good Sam. Uh, a long time ago, my wife and I were displaced. Uh, back in 2015, 2016, and if it wasn't for Good Sam, I don't know where we would be. Uh, Good Sam is an extremely hardworking organization, uh, and um, I mean, I know there needs to be more work done, but that's all I have to say. I mean, without Good Sam, you know, uh, you know, we wouldn't um, be housed. That's all I have to say about that. Thank you. I, I want to question the um, process in that you uh, warned that you it was one appointment and you have not uh, you're you're changing to making two appointments without having given the other people an opportunity to know that there was going to be more than one appointment, especially the <laughs> people who were rejected on the first round. Thank you, Stephen. All right. So, any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, thank you all. And uh, thank you, Morgan, and to Rick, if you're listening, um, uh, for your willingness to serve. It's great. Um, all right, so on to the Public Art Commission uh, application. So there were two seats available there, and we had one um, uh, applicant in Ward Joyce. Is there a motion? Yeah. I'd like to move that we appoint Ward Joyce to the Public Art Commission. Second. Further discussion? Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. OK. Thanks, Ward, for serving also. Uh, OK. Catching up to where we are. All right. Uh, we are up to, oh, yes, go ahead. Bef oh. Before we move on to the next item, I meant to mention this in the consent agenda and just missed it, but since our DPW staff, so I just want to acknowledge that um, one of the things you approved in the consent agenda was our loan resolution for um, our loan with the USDA RD, uh, and that includes a grant for 
six yeah. million dollars, reducing the cost of, of our plant, as well as a very favorable loan term, so which just makes a huge difference in the affordability of this project. Uh, as you recall, we spent a number of years assessing the risk and the costs, and if it weren't for Kurt Modica, who's in the room, and I want to make sure to recognize him, as well as Zach still here, Todd Preventure and others, um, this wouldn't have happened. And this is a really, this really changes the whole economics of this project, which was already, you know, I think a good thing for us to do. So even though it's not a discussion item, I think it's important to call that out. Thank you. We should clap. I know, right? <laughs> it, it is really a big deal. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, all right, so we are up to uh, an update on uh, Five Home Farm Way and the Two Rivers Partnership. Uh, welcome to Jamie. Good evening, Jamie Duggan, and uh, here to give you a short status update. Um, in the few months since I was here last, uh, we have had some progress. Uh, I am now in contact, uh, I've been in contact finally with the Attorney General's office. They got back to me. I have a primary contact there now, and I've had a few discussions uh, with them. Uh, I'm inching ever closer to signing a letter of engagement with uh, legal counsel and hope to have that by the end of this week, which will be a big step forward. Um, it, was a, it was a long process. Uh, there were a number of folks who uh, did not have any time and a few who declined uh, due to uh, pre-existing conflicts of interest but uh, nevertheless got through that. Um, <clears throat> uh, we've had a, there was, uh, I guess, I guess we'd call it a, a somewhat of an unfortunate setback with the passing of Paul Brun from the Preservation Trust of Vermont, but um, re-engaging with them to ensure that some financial support for legal assistance that was offered earlier is still in play, and I believe that it is, but uh, waiting to get a confirmation on that. And uh, a couple of volunteers have started and will continue over the next few weekends to do some just general clearing outside of the house just to make it a little more uh, appealing aesthetically uh, for before winter sets in. So that's where things are at the moment. I do hope to return, uh, as we had said, in three months with a, a, a more substantial uh, report uh, updating you where we are. It doesn't perhaps seem like a lot, but I feel like we've made a great amount of progress in the last few months. So I don't know if you have any questions, but... Any questions? Uh, Donna. Well, I'm encouraged that people are answering their phones for you. I am. <laughs> <laughs> That's an improvement. We, we recognize the small steps, but it's good. Yeah. Okay. They're important. Um, what is the biggest thing that you need in the process at this point? I, I think still uh, the ownership issue yeah, okay. is what we're focusing on yeah. uh, diligently. Mm -hmm. And I, th I, I truly believe uh, once uh, legal counsel has a chance to do some analysis on the existing documents and situation, <laughs> uh, that'll provide a much more clear path forward as far as how that will be structured and, and what our next steps are. So, Well, I, I guess my question is about, uh, you mentioned you're, you all are inching closer to sending a letter of engagement um, with some legal counsel. Um, is that, I mean, is, is that uh, for lack of funding or is it for like just finding the right person or? Um, I, I feel that we've uh, got a great partner now okay. and so it's just allowing the process to uh, to run its course. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> I'm patiently waiting. Great, okay. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Jack. Thank you for the report. Keep, keep on moving forward. I, a request I have is that uh, it doesn't have to be very long, but when you do a report like this, if you could even get us a one-pager um, so that the one-page, whatever the reports you're doing will also be able to be put on the city web page. Mm -hmm. so members of the public can also stay appraised of what's happening. Yep. I, I will definitely do that. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Great. Any other questions? It's no, good news. Great. Okay. Thanks for your time and continuing support. Yes. Well, likewise. <laughs> okay. 
All right, so we have a series of updates uh, at this point, um, starting with the winter operations and parking ban, and then into uh, CSO financials, uh, and then some other um, uh, waste uh, water resource recovery facility, and then the water and sewer uh, infrastructure. So, um, yeah, but w welcome up uh, the winter operations and parking ban. Thank you for inviting us here to talk tonight about winter operations. My name is Donna Barlow Casey. I am the Public Works Director here in Montpelier, and I'm joined by Zach Blodgett, our new project manager um, in the restructuring for the Public Works Department. Um, and tonight we will present an overview to you that really is consistent with the title Winter is Coming. And we have a lot of decisions that we hope we can make collectively tonight and have a good discussion. We know that um, we won't be able to tackle everything that we would like to, but we're going to give you as much information as we can so that we can have an ongoing dialogue um, that just begins tonight. Um, and so, for the sake of everybody, Our snow heroes. I know the our snow heroes come out of our streets department and other departments um, in the city every winter, and they handle an amazing amount of challenges um, on our behalf. Um, and um, I don't expect that this um, this upcoming season will be any different. Um, so to tonight, I. Um, Zach and I will review with you the, the cost of winter operations. And I think that anybody who's been through a winter here in Montpelier, which is pretty much everybody in the room, um, knows that the cost isn't just financial. Um, the cost is there for impacts to staff morale over long shifts, um, <coughs> significant overtime, challenges with parked cars, that are in spaces and places that they might not uh, need to be. Um, there are um, a variety of other challenges that have uh, um, grown over the past decade. Um, every mile that we add to a street or portion of a mile, every bike path, every walking path that we have in town has to be cared for in the winter. Um, there are other communities that choose to let some of their paths go um, for winter skiing, um, cross country skiing, or just um, fall um, aside as um, a lane for transportation, uh, pedestrian transportation. Um, we have not made any of those decisions in our community. Um, we also have, um, we have expectations by residents and businesses. Um, we would like to arrive at a place where we are consistent, the council's consistently messaging what's possible, and so we're going to give you a lot of information tonight to consider, um, and then we can reflect on that. I'll, Later in the presentation, we'll talk about how we have some plans for connecting with our constituents and um, residents and visitors um, to um, create a reasonable expectation of what's possible. Um, and the other um, topic I want to cover today um, a bit is that um, staffing in the street department is down from what it was 10 years ago, but we're doing many more miles, many more hours, with many more challenges, and as um, climate shifts occur, freezing rain, um, ice accumulation, um, they all have um, impacts on our ability to manage the winter. Um, so um, we have prepared a presentation. Zach's going to run you through the majority of it. He's going to be our narrator. I will jump in occasionally and add some comments. And um, by the time we get to the end of the presentation, um, we're hopeful that 
we'll have a constructive conversation and, and make some decisions tonight that we can implement. So uh, first of all, I'd just like to uh, thank uh, our, our crews for all the hard work that they did last year. Um, and in developing this presentation, uh, Eric Ladd, who is our equipment supervisor, who's not here tonight, um, he really spent, I would say, over a week or two weeks uh, compiling all the data that is used in this presentation, going back uh, all the way to 1985, um, with some historical knowledge about uh, crews and how many employees we had uh, back in before I was alive <laughs> so um, anyways uh, as you guys know it was not last last winter was very challenging for not only DPW but for other departments within the city um, the fire department police department even uh, Bill's office the city manager's office uh, all experienced um, a very rough winter in terms of customer complaints. Um, it went from even in Montpelier, the fire department was helping us with shovel out hydrants um, because we couldn't get to them. Uh, police was struggling with removing cars uh, within the winter parking ban. Um, so there was a lot of different struggles and that's uh, why we're here is to discuss uh, what happened last year and how can we improve on uh, it moving forward. So. Uh, with that being said, uh, turn the lights down. Sure. Sure. Uh, with that being said, w um, throughout this presentation, we are going to go over the following and touch upon each of these things. Uh, the equipment and maintenance operations that we currently have, how they've changed historically uh, from uh, over time, the salt purchasing and usage, uh, and how. We, how the operational changes that have occurred uh, throughout time and how the climate has impacted them. We will take a look at uh, personnel overtime and labor costs. Um, in addition, we will look at uh, how expectations have changed uh, for our operation side of it. We are now doing a lot more um, maintenance um, than we once were and that expectation to continue to maintain those is uh, it's become it's become a challenge for DPW uh, as we expand our networks out um, in addition uh, the winter operations lead into summer summertime impacts uh, our guys spend a lot of time during the winter and they have to always be on call with available status so as a result it carries forward into the summer uh, they want to take time off they want to go on vacations they want to see their family um, so it, there's a, a trickle effect uh, that doesn't just last throughout the winter it actually lingers into the summer uh, we also want to discuss the desired level of service so as we expand our networks and change things in the future what is this level of service that we want to provide to all of our to our community in addition, we want to touch upon how we can improve on communications and what we believe are the next steps. I guess I would just also add, just to please be conscious of the time. Yes. Yeah. Okay, will, Karen. We'll, we'll go faster than we have been. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, as you guys all know, uh, this. Uh, the trend of winter has been more extremes, more um, micro uh, microbursts. Um, so we've been experiencing some more difficult situations. Um, and what that leads to is this uh, question about safe roads at safe speeds versus bare roads. Um, the state of Vermont and Montpelier has a safe roads at safe speeds policy. Uh, but at certain times, uh, with the amount of calls that we receive and the complaints that we're, that we're getting, it seems like we're trying to move towards a more of a bare roads uh, policy. So that's some of the discussion that we would like to have. And I think I'll just throw in here that um, achieving bare roads um, is, is probably not possible. That sounds good, but it is way too intensive um, and costly. Safe roads at safe speed sounds, in comparison, to be somewhat. Um, you can move the mic into the oh, Sorry. Um, so, uh, safe roads at safe speed sounds like um, uh, 
a lesser um, condition, but it's not. Safe roads at safe speeds represent what we are able to do at a maximum level to keep um, our con travelers safe. Um, and bare roads are just not um, a viable option. Um, there's hardly any community um, in that experiences significant snowfall that has a bare roads policy. Um, so we're hoping that the council um, can help us message this to constituents. We know that you get calls over the winter months, and we really want to emphasize that what we're doing on an ongoing basis complies with very safe roads as long as people choose to travel at safe speeds. Thank you. So uh, here's an overview of our equipment. We have 16 pieces of equipment for plowing, salting, sanding that are in our fleet. Uh, that is uh, one pickup, five F, uh, F550s, two larger plow trucks with a, with a sander uh, and a plow, four <coughs> plow trucks with a spreader and a wing, uh, three trackless uh, sidewalk uh, plows with, uh, that also have a snowblower, uh, plow, and spreader, and then a mini loader with a plow, snowblower, and spreader as well. And then for snow removal equipment, we have six pieces of equipment, one grader, uh, three bucket loaders, and then the two uh, large loader mounted snow blowers. Um, so as you can see, we have for we have 16 total pieces of equipment. We have 13 routes. Uh, so anytime we have a snowstorm, we have to deploy 13 of these pieces of equipment. Uh, we have 10 streets people that are devoted at any time to fill that equipment. So at any given time, we're calling on other water sewer people, mechanics, people within other departments to make sure that we can fill the routes uh, that we have for all of our pieces of equipment. This next slide, I don't think we have to spend a lot of time on it. It's meant to demonstrate that over the years, we make a great effort um, to upgrade our um, equipment to be appropriate, um, cutting edge in some instances, and that we continue to do that. And it creates um, opportunities for us to do things like changing how we plow sidewalks. Um, originally, we were pushing snow and only pushing snow. Now we are able to clear the sidewalk, lay down um, salt um, and sand, um, all in one travel um, through, which saves time and, and creates efficiencies. And we're constantly um, we're constantly upgrading our ability to increase efficiencies um, through the purchase of new equipment. So the original uh, bombardier uh, plow is uh, the top is the top picture right there, where it could only just push the snow. And back in 1995-96 era, uh, we were only really predominantly clearing the downtown district. We weren't going up in, in the top of Northfield Street, Town Hill. It was just per, our, per, our focus was really in the in the downtown. In 2005, we bought our first uh, trackless unit, which allowed us to be able to uh, salt and sand and have more versatile operations uh, throughout. Um, and then we started expanding. And now we pretty much everything that we have for sidewalk, we are asked to clear, salt, sand, and treat. Um, so that's where we're at today. So, as you can see, uh, over over the last few years, um, in particular, we've added a lot. We've added sidewalks and roads, and in addition, we have future sidewalks that uh, we will be adding. Um, so every time that we add a length of sidewalk, we just kind of the natural tendency is that oh, DPW can absorb it. It's something that we're already doing, but we really haven't stopped and thought about what, how much time does that actually take? How much time does adding one mile of sidewalk take our crews to do? So I'll just give you a quick rundown. We have 20, around 27 miles of sidewalk. We have three sidewalk plows that are responsible for clearing the entire, the entire city. So that means each plow uh, is responsible for approximately nine miles. Uh, and that route takes them generally four to five hours to complete. So that's about two miles an hour. So if you think of it, for every mile we add, it's a, it's a significant cost to DPW. I mean, 
either we're losing level of service, if we add a mile, we either have to have a diminished level of service that we're providing to um, the public, or we need to add an additional person or <coughs> You know, a 0.15 FTE for every mile is what we've estimated, um, is what it takes for us to be able to maintain the current level of service that we already provide today. Uh, the newest piece of equipment you can see is the bottom picture there. Uh, it is a mini loader. It is much more versatile. It, in addition to uh, being a great winter operations piece of equipment, it also ha ha serves a purpose year round, so we use it throughout all the summer months. Whereas previously, uh, some of the other pieces of equipment we only could really use for winter operations. So, here is a, a graph trend from 1992 to today of our salt usage. Um, so, as I already told you, in 95, we were our focus was in the downtown area, um, and prior to 1995, we were actually salting and by hand. Um, so these, what you see here is uh, tons that we were doing when we were only focused within the downtown area. And then over time, we've expanded. We, you can see that we've ramped up. A lot more uh, salt was purchased over the years. And then it kind of leveled off. We've become way more efficient. But while becoming more efficient, we've really expanded on our, the network. And we, that every ton of salt goes a lot further than it did uh, even, I would say, five years ago. Uh, in 2014, we uh, started using this, uh, we started using Magic Minus, which helps lower the temperature, which is, it's been great for us. Um, and it's a, it's a great tool for us to use. Um, but as you can see, I mean, we need to, we generally use over 2,500 tons of salt per year. And at this point, we have pretty much reached our Effectiveness. That I don't think that we can, unless it's a really lean winter, uh, that we can actually reduce that number uh, by much because it's all mechanically controlled now. All right, so here is a graph, and there's kind of a lot of information here. Uh, over the last nine years, uh, almost a decade, we've been recording data at our uh, water resource recovery facility, uh, and it takes uh, snowfall accumulations, precipitation, and temperature. So as you can see in the last well, almost 10 years, uh, last year was the, the heaviest, the worst uh, snow year that we've had of almost 100 inches. Uh, we also have reports for this area of up to 120 inches. Uh, the water plant or the water resource recovery facility generally tends to have a lower snowfall amount because it's down at the, at the bottom of by the Winooski, whereas up in Town Hill in the upper areas, uh, you can see a, a greater snowfall total. In addition, it was the lowest average temperature for that winter, for those winter months, and the highest precipitation. Um, so what that means is it was very taxing on our department. Um, it took a lot of uh, effort to keep up with uh, the, the winter weather. Um, in addition, you can also see the on the red line that, that is our salt usage. At, so at 3,100 tons, that was what we used last year. Um, and in comparison to other years that weren't as severe, we use, um, it, can, it just shows that we're becoming more efficient at what we're doing um, as things are uh, getting harder for us to do. Here's another uh, graph that shows our salt usage uh, versus overtime. Um, so back in 1992, we were spending a lot of hours to put down roughly the same amount of salt, um, but it wasn't going, it wasn't being spread out nearly as far. Now we are becoming more efficient at uh, spreading that same salt and it's being used in a lot in a much wider area, um, much more roads and sidewalks are being treated. So here is a, a graph of uh, where we where we were with employees down at the garage. Um, in 1985, we had uh, around 35 employees uh, down at the the public works garage, and now we're down to 24 and a half. That half is a shared employee uh, that we share with the cemetery division. 
Um, and as you can, so the green bar here shows you all the employees at the garage where the orange bar next to it shows you the employees that were involved in plowing or winter operations. So last year, it took almost everyone that we had at the garage in order to perform winter operations. And what that, what that translated to is there were some events that I'm sure you all remember uh, when we had water leaks that we were, you know, we weren't really ready. We didn't have people available because they were, they had been out all night with uh, helping out with winter operations. Um, you can see in some of the other years where the green bar is significantly larger than the orange bar or the the trend line, that it uh, those employees were typically our water sewer guys that were ready for um, any of those events. Before we go on. Oops. Excuse me. Before we go on, and I realize we're running late here, and we have a lot of information to share with you, so we're going to try and just move this forward a little faster. Um, we are currently down, technically down, two of our employees for the coming winter. And we have not added, even though you've heard for the first half of this presentation how much miles have been added and how many efficiencies we've tried to create, um, we have two people on light duty, and so that will dramatically impact our ability to um, keep overtime under control. We have come to the conclusion that a reasonable, humane um, average for our staff of between 200 and 250 overtime hours per person per winter season is a reasonable expectation. Last year, we had people with four, over 400 hours of just overtime. And that is what causes us to have impacts that go past the winter season. Because when you have that much overtime, you come <laughs> off the season exhausted. You have lots of opportunity to um, want to be doing things with your family because you haven't seen them all winter long. Um, and we really need to begin this year to think about that and pull that average back. Um, and I'm sure it won't happen unless we have an un usually mild winter. Um, so um, this is just a, a long-term um, desire on our part to really rein this in. Do you consider that to be 16 weeks for, uh, for the length of the season? So, so they actually, we, what we looked at was uh, from mid-November to April, and that when we looked, when we pulled out our work orders, um, we basically took from the first day that we had any snow winter operation event uh, that occurred to the very end when the last um, winter operation event. So it was, it was uh, somewhere in a, approximately five months worth okay. of uh, time. It's more, more like 20 weeks, 20, okay. 20 so weeks. Yep. Thanks. So here's a chart of each of our, uh, our winter overtime, our employees with the amount of hours that they spent uh, in overtime. Um, so at, uh, the target range that we have within the budget is around, on average, a, between, it's around 175 hours per employee. Uh, as you can see, there's the dotted there's the dotted line here, right here. Everyone to the right is it within the streets division, and they were all uh, above 200 hours. Uh, at 200 hours, we have realized that people stop picking up the phone. There's they they, they just don't want to do it anymore. They've hit they like the money. They like you know, um, they like providing for the family, but at a certain point, they just get tired, and. Um, so we want to make sure that we're not overworking our guys. We, you know, the joke last year was that we were borderline a mutiny for from our guys um, because they were they just didn't they'd had enough. Um, so if, if we actually take all of these that are above this target range, uh, that's 840 hours, which is the if we took just the regular days available to work within that that five month span. It is exactly one employee, um, just in a reduction in overtime hours to meet the, the target level um, that we look for for our guys. And in addition, we've also talked with some other communities, and they have verified that around 200 hours, everyone is starting to, to go the other way. 
Uh, on the left side, this is everyone else that had to participate in winter operations and the hours that they uh, also uh, helped out. So with that being said, uh, this is what it cost us last year in labor alone. We're not talking materials um, or some of our other expenses. Uh, just salting, sanding, plowing, and snow removal uh, was a $200,000 operation. 104 of it was in overtime costs alone. Here is the department as a whole. Um, everything that we did from for work orders between November and April uh, translated to about $300,000 worth of work. And as you can see, there was about around 13,000 hours and only 4,000 of those hours were dedicated to something other than winter operations. So everything with the orange, the purple, and the pink are all winter ops. And then the, these two pieces over here are water leaks and things that are, were not related to um, winter operations. So where does that leave us in the summer? Um, it leaves us with a, a lot of time that people want to go and go on vacation. Uh, and what it equates to is about four people on average that can be gone any given day uh, throughout the summer. Can I ask you a question about that? Yeah. Just the way the hours work out, um, it's still a one full-time position, or like a, a full-time position might have a majority of the hours being spent, uh, I guess, together with overtime in the winter. That leaves people with more time to take off in the summer, or? So because they're on available status, they're not really, we, they're not, I'm not gonna say they're not allowed to take a vacation during the winter, but they generally don't take time in the winter. Right. So it's all accumulated, <laughs> and then they all wanna leave once the weather turns nice. Right, right. So, so they, they have some built-in vacation time. Built they, vacation, they just... sick, there's a whole list of different times okay. that they get. Uh, comp is one of them. <clears throat> um, some, a lot of people take, choose to take comp and then take it off at a different time of the year. Okay. Is the, the standard work week is 37 and a half, so the comp time is the, is the difference between 37 and a half and 40? Uh, so standard work week for us is, I think, 40. Um, okay. And the comp is a little tricky because not everyone takes comp. Some of them choose to take it as, over, as overtime. Okay. Um, so. It's uh, not. Under the law, we have to either pay them or provide comp at time and a half, and so they can choose which way they take it. So some, some take the leave, some take the cash. Thank you, Bill. Okay. That's it. So where does that leave us? What are the next steps for DPW? Um, are, have we reached our peak effectiveness? Uh, we really believe that we have, we're pretty much at that level. Um, in terms of fleet management, the routes that our guys are doing, um, we don't, right now, we just don't see where we can become more effective. Um, are we providing, we want to define the level of service that we want to provide. Um, so are our expectations, is the community's expectations reasonable for the work that we need to do? Um, Establishing a target range for acceptable overtime, as we told you, we'd like to see everyone beneath that 200 mark, ideally between 150 and 175 hours. Um, we would like to consider the impacts of the increased maintenance, the miles that we have added with new streets, uh, pass, uh, all these different uh, things that we've added, the transit center. Um, how does that translate into public work um, maintenance responsibilities? Uh, some of the other things that uh, we have looked at for this year are adjusting the towing, um, allowing the, the service companies to store vehicles. Um, right now we're looking up at the rec field um, as a possible area so that we may be able to get a few more tow companies on board um, this year. And in addition to uh, modifications of the current parking ban and the night parking practices. Um, so if DPW had its way, we would tell you that our most effective, um, the, 
operational procedure would be to go back to the old ban and to have everyone off the street. That's just the reality. We know that that may not be feasible, it may not be feasible here, uh, but what we're asking to consider is what are some other options? Um, can we move to a alternate side um, of the street parking? So a lot of places have even calendar day, even side of the street. Odd calendar day, odd side of the street. It's fairly clear, it's easy to message, um, but that it, what that does is it allows us to get the snow out of the area when the people are not there, um, rather than having, we spend a lot of time going back, uh, trying to get around one specific car or having to put out no parking signs. Um, so there's, there's some modifications that uh, we think could be made to the, the ban that it currently stands um, that would improve uh, not just DPW operations, but also help out with uh, the amount of cars that are towed that PD has for cars towed. In addition to those, sorry, in addition to those um, items on our wish list, um, I think that um, we would like to have an additional employee. We're not sure that that's possible for this year, but that is definitely something that would help us. You've seen it. we can't diminish the amount of overtime without some additional help, and we're already accessing all the additional help we have through all the other part, uh, departments. Um, we do um, want to increase public communications. We've just launched um, in public works over the last couple of weeks our own DPW Facebook page. We were getting very positive responses um, to the information. We're trying to develop new um, ways of communicating what's happening and enc encourage people to um, like that and follow us there. Um, consistent communication between departments with the public, um, consistent communication um, by the count all council members, that's very helpful if we use the same language and same terminology and we're on the same page as you um, and the decisions that you're making on our our behalf, um, and um, I think that um, the expectation of level of service is a big issue for us to resolve just because um, that underpins all the communication that we'll be having from um, the first snow going forward. And um, as of today, this afternoon, the forecast from the group that we rely on for winter forecasts has the first snow event beginning on November 7th and continuing through the 8th, the 9th, the 10th, and the 11th. And so while they expect just dustings in those days, that is far sooner than we would like to have it happen. Um, so um, that's... Yeah, I just want to I just want to point out that um, there are a few areas in specific that we routinely get a lot of complaints on, and the, I'm sure you guys are all familiar with those areas. And I'm just going to run through them really quickly: Liberty, uh, Berry Street, Hubbard, and Loomis. All areas where we have parking on both sides of the street, fairly narrow to begin with. Um, they really it, it, they're very difficult for not only DPW but even emergency services uh, to navigate through those areas. Um, so we're just, we're unsure how we're gonna tackle that this year um, if nothing changes, uh, because it still presents a problem for us to do our operational duties uh, in those areas. Have you driven around, I, I'm intrigued by this alternate side of the street idea have you have you driven around at night to take an inventory of how many cars are parked out on these streets uh, on both sides on a typical I actually night? recently did it about a week ago um, and it was because there were paving stone cutters uh, way uh, that night so I took a drive around and all of the streets that I just mentioned had cars parked on them in addition to those streets there were a few cars on Main Street a few cars up by the college um, and predominantly those 
they were fairly focused around the rental properties, uh, uh, areas where there's a lot of uh, housing, apartment housing units. Um, so, so is there a place to put the cars if you say you can only park on one side of the street? Well, I, I can tell you that any time that we to. call a winter parking ban for when, when actually snow is forecasted, mm -hmm. those, the amount of cars that we're towing on those events is very few. Uh, most nights, maybe one to two. Uh, it's when we have an, a need to do winter snow removal or that it's not intuitive that the snow is coming that we end up towing 20, 30 cars on any given night. Um, so it's, it's not when it's forecasted and everyone knows that we have this, you know, this winter weather event coming um, because people are, are getting the message and getting and parking someplace else, um, which is why we're, we've wondered if they can do it on that day, can they do it every other day of the, the year, or can they do it um, more frequently? Have we thought about a parking garage in town? Maybe address that? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> it actually is one of the things it would provide. Right. 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 Covered um, only parking. Is there um, any further questions? Uh, Lauren, actually, could we get the lights back on? Thank you very much. No worries. Not, yet. And not, not right now, though. No, go ahead. Can. So, given the way you described um, like it's I'm right on top of it. Um, can't hear you. The um, given the way you described a snow event, for example, and there's all the equipment and you need to fill all the equipment. Um, so, seeing the stats and the the need for staffing, like how much does one extra body fill that need versus more people on call, or you know, like does how much does does hiring one FTE, for example, close that gap of the overtime issues? Um, in, in your assessment? Uh, so I think that we could take a chunk of that overtime. We're not, you're not going to be able to eliminate all of that overtime uh, because, frankly, we also can't choose when the weather event is going to occur. I think uh, what that extra FTE would allow us to do is to provide a more reasonable level uh, for our crews on, you know, throughout the winter. Uh, we're also looking at, I mean, we've been actively talking to other departments about you know possibly helping if we're in a pinch or what what that may be uh, we're looking at night uh, different shift differentials but it becomes a lot more complex when you have when you need 13 pieces of equipment in order to to do the route uh, it's hard to only do half a route and not all of it I can get into the details but uh, not all of our equipment has four-wheel drive so each route is designed that a small truck and a big truck We'll tag team that route. The small truck goes out ahead of the big truck uh, so that they can make sure that they can get up the hills. So a lot of times you see them going up the middle of the road and then the big truck will actually come through the lane and clear the lanes. Um, so it's a little hard to give you a very specific uh, answer on that. Um, if you would like, we can try to give you a little bit more of a, an exact number. That's helpful, thanks. Okay. Any other questions? What's the turnover rate in DPW compared to some of the other departments there? I know we're down like two FTEs here, but I mean, I saw Tom McCardle standing in like a foot of water barking orders like a general with everybody bleary eyed around them. Not a job I'd want to go to every day, you know? So I, I would think one FTE is probably like cost neutral, anyways. But I, I just wonder about the human level of some of this stuff. Like, I hate treating our employees like that. Um, and I, I can't imagine the winter's going to get any better. It's, you might not have the turnover rate at your fingertips, sir. We have, it's, it's my understanding, um, just being here a short time, that um, we have an unbelievably loyal mm. group of people. That doesn't mean they're satisfied, they're happy, or they're um, functional after a winter. Um, and, and so that impacts all of our other operations. So I think that an additional employee um, alleviates some of that, allows us to get back to um, a better standard. Um, and that will flow forward into better summer operations because if you're not spending 400 hours, even 350 hours of overtime, you're, you're a little more resilient and able to 
take on work. So we ha I, I don't think we've really looked at that. Well, so in my experience, the turn I in the last uh, off the top of my head over the last five years, I can only name one employee that has willingly chosen to leave. Everyone else has been a retiree, right? That they've worked 20, 30 years within the department. Um, not everyone stays if they started in water sewer. Not everyone wants to stay with water sewer. You see some of them going to streets, finding a different home within the city. Uh, but I would say in general that I haven't really experienced the high turnover rate um, even within our crews. Uh, Jonathan Glenn. So you, you mentioned about having alternating sides of the street. Are you going to be asking us to make a specific decision tonight? Are you going to come back and give us a specific proposal? Is that something that you all would be would like to consider, um, and possibly even implementing this year as a pilot? Or um, we were trying to gauge your your feeling on even implementing something like that. Well, I mean, I personally think something has to give. That I mean, I remember hearing Tom talk about the fact that the cleanup works take so much longer. And once people have gotten used to this, I'm going to call service on demand of the snow, they're not so willing to not be on the street when you need to clean it up. And that just takes a lot of human power to notify and post. And so I'd rather see something straightforward and that we, we make a more of a compromise that helps the crew and still helps our parkers. Glenn. Um. I kind of want to come back to what Donna was saying, but the question I had before that was uh, um, just clarifying. You said a couple of times that uh, we were focusing on the center parts of the city until 95. That's, I, I wasn't around then, but yep. that's my understanding, yeah. Is and after 95, they started to. Right, so the clarifying part is, and in, is that in just early for sidewalks? In the 2000s, the council said we want all sidewalks done. Okay. So what was what was unclear to me was all of the roads were getting plowed throughout town. Correct. When you were saying we were focusing on the center of town, it was just the sidewalks. Okay. Yes. Okay. Understood. And um, the other perhaps less less useful question, but but I'm curious to know whether there has been uh, a significant or or noted increase or change in in pedestrian activity. Over the winter, are people doing more walking than they used to? Uh, given the the and uh, you know perhaps that could help ease the pressure on the roads if if more people are walking, fewer of them are driving. I don't know. We don't yeah. typically do ped counts, uh, especially during the winter. Um, I, I, yeah, if I can jump in, I think the um, I mean that was part of the council goal was to to make us more pedestrian friendly. And I think one thing that's important to understand is that. Sidewalks don't melt the same way that roads do. They don't have the, the rubber friction. So even if they're high, high pedestrian, they're not going to sort of wear off in the same way. So uh, we've often got complaints. You don't clear the sidewalks to the same extent that you clear the roads. When in fact we actually we are. They're just not sort of melting the same way. Um, I, I think it's probably anecdotal. We don't have data. But with the sidewalks clear, more people are using them. I don't know if that's changing vehicle use or not, um, particularly in the cold yeah. and nasty weather. Um, and back to the kind of conversation about whether we are going to change anything tonight uh, in terms of the policy or not. Um, I'm, I would be willing to go along with a policy change now. Uh, it does seem like we're hard up against uh, the winter, and and it feels to me like it it is. I think it, a lot of it does feel like it's a communication problem that that uh, residents are to some extent used to what we've been doing for the last couple of years, and if we change it right now, many of them will be potentially blindsided. Yeah, that, so I wanted to jump in again. You know, we've had this conversation, and while I, I certainly appreciate and support the work of our DPW, I would not recommend that we make a change, despite knowing how much they want to, and and public works, and excuse me, police and fire would like us to as well. I feel like you know our band starts in another two weeks, 
and we haven't had adequate time to notify people. As you say, people have gotten used to the current system. Um, you know, we, we raised this issue in the spring with the specter that maybe we would not have a, a tow operator, in which case I think then it would have been clear. If we can't tow the cars, then they've got to be, we've got to do a full on winter ban. Uh, we don't have any real choice. Um, I, I think I'd recommend that we at least start as planned, and if we have a, if it comes crisis, then we can maybe try to change it. But I think it's it's difficult. We've we've already started publishing information about the winter ban. I know the bridge had a piece about it. Um, as you say, people have come to expect that. Um, if we're going to seriously consider a change in policy, we ought to be thinking about it, evaluating this winter, and publicizing it as much in advance as possible. Because even having done this for a few years now, people don't understand it. So changing it is going to probably just make more confusion. I tell you, I, I really lean back to going back to the total ban. It was so much straightforward. But I feel if we do something and do it for two months, say January, we make a change and that we notify people. So you can still give them some lead time. It may not happen November 15th, but I feel like we can, especially That's these good. core streets that are such a problem, it's, it's just not a good use of personnel power. Whether it's DPW, the city clerk, I mean, we all get the complaints, and we put it out there and we communicate, I think we can do it. It's your That's call. An interesting thought, of, you know, possibly of starting something new in January. Don and I had considered that uh, just because we knew that, by, you know, before Thanksgiving, trying to implement something, yeah. you know, this at this time of the year is probably you're not going to have a lot of success. But if you had a target of say, you know, New Year, January first, the city's going to be trying this for this the second half of the winter season. Um, that's something that we would be for. Uh, Jack, would that require an ordinance change or do we have a public safety does do we have authority to issue an order for that I was assume it would be an ordinance change which of course creates lead time probably want to take a closer look at that we can um, but there is uh, the current you know gives the manager the authority to call the bands um, so I suppose that you know we could assume that it implies that we would have a ban on one side or the other or total ban, uh, but we'd want to look at that, and I think. Well, I, I'd like to be exploring yeah. that. Uh, Lauren. Um, just wondering, is there data on, I mean, I could see how in alternating sides, you could also have people violating that and you end up towing, I mean, I don't know what data <laughs> or success or examples from elsewhere, I mean, maybe there's like a year lag or like learning curve, but um, did, I mean, have, has the experience you've seen elsewhere that is, um, inspiring you to put this forward of like people follow it great and there's perfect compliance unlike the ban or are we going to still be dealing with the same issue um, anyway and then people are dealing with moving their cars all the time so there's it's kind of a two-pronged uh, kind of approach because it's the alternating sides would not just be useful for winter operations it's something that could be used for street sweeping I don't know how many times we've got complaints about this area has debris or not is unable to be cleared. Um, so it's it's another way. Most other communities that have implemented the alternating alternating sides um, also use it. They use it year round. It's not just a seasonal ban. Um, I don't know, and I could maybe find out based on a few communities uh, how successful they were um, with year one and year two. Uh, but I don't know that information off the top of my head. We could we could bring. We could come back um, at the next meeting with that information. I'm sure we can make some phone calls. That would be interesting. Um, even if at the next meeting, well, even if you're able to just send an update or an email, that would be useful. Um, I would picture maybe not necessarily having a, a meet, like having it on the agenda, unless you are also making a proposal. Do you know what I mean? Like, yep. Yep. Um, let's put it on the agenda when you're ready to come back with like a, here's what we'd recommend if there's going to be a change. Does that sound all right? Okay. Yes. Great. Super. Any other questions from council? No. 
Well, just thank time. you for all this information and thanks. Eric, was it who gathered it? Yes. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. Eric. Great, great. All the charts, it's very nice. And I believe there were some comments or questions from the public. Um, so yeah, go ahead, Larry. Hi, Lauren Sadler again. Um, you know, myself being an advocate, um, I have one big, huge chunk. Um, I think there needs to be, especially for my wife um, being challenged as well as myself, um, there's still, uh, you know, in terms of the winter stuff, there's still a lot of cracks in the street that needs to be fixed. Um, one of the, um, there's a lot, uh, one big, huge boo-boo, as, like as I like to call it, is the uh, ramp by city center, and when it snows, um, that ramp, you know, a lot of wheelchairs use it, including my wife. Um, um, I don't know if the Department of Public Works can work on fixing the cracks by the ramp um, before, because there's cracks, cracks by the ramp as well as in the, um, on the sidewalks. Um, and also I was wondering if your equipment, your snow removal equipment, can, if we can have, if, you know, especially with the population of Washington County being special needs also, I'm wondering if there can be a couple of extra days added to, or something else that can be done to like really remove, I mean, not just pile the snow, but like really remove it, um, especially when there's obstructions from snow, ice, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Or unless you wanted to address that question. Or you don't have, state. you don't have to, you can also follow state. up later if you'd okay. like. Well, okay, well, I guess I'll follow up later. Great, thank you. Yes. Uh, Steve Whitaker. Uh, I'm concerned about the <coughs> recurring uh, shimming or the drainage. We've got a lot of standing water. I've been talking to our public work director that I think we're, we're almost in a, a slow moving emergency here. It's, it's coming on winter. We haven't dealt with problems of standing water in the crosswalks that I raised to your attention two years ago. And they require some shimming of, of the asphalt to get the water to get into the drains. And if we don't do that before winter, you're gonna have yet another thing to add on to this overworked crew. <coughs> so. I, I sense that you need to take some action. Uh, I have a couple of ideas that I think, not waiting till January, but engaging more with the public. I've offered to try to get this presentation done in video where it could be played more useful to the citizens. But you also might want to consider some like neighborhood zones of cooperation where people will remind each other to get their cars out of the way. Um, on, on towing, because the more they cooperate with the vehicle removal and the maintenance, the better off the whole neighborhood's going to be. But imposing that just from the, the traffic czar's uh, authority is not going to be as effective. Uh, so I would ask you to put a priority on the crosswalk and drainage issue before winter hits. Uh, I don't know how to do that with FTEs. Um, I'll also point out that this winter burnout is coming it, coming out of the summer catch up. Uh, we got a decade of neglected maintenance on our sidewalks and in, in our potholes, et cetera. And it's gonna take a long time to dig out from that. But when you burn out folks in the winter, they're not likely to be looking for more work to do in the summer. And you're at about two minutes. Thank you. Your two minute clock uh, in the prior session when you only had three people speaking, it, I've mentioned it's, it's not consistent with the guidance from the League of Cities and Towns and open meeting law to watch your two minute clock so closely. Thank you, Stephen. We're gonna keep with the two minute clock. Okay, yes. Um, question for the manager. I know that uh, we've heard about this 
crosswalk and uh, drainage issue before, and I seem to recall that there's, at least with some of the drainage issues, there's a, a bit of a dispute between who did the contractor that did some work on state highways. Is that right? On Correct. State? Although I'll toss this to see if DPW knows about this. I do know that um, a number of the uh, issues that were brought uh, were uh, also raised t to the uh, the state contractor, and that they tried to take care of some of them. Whether they were successful in the work that they did, um, that is, is uh, obviously that there's probably some crosswalks that they attempted to do something and uh, they didn't have the right approach, or they were unsuccessful um, in resolving that. Um, I know that there are some that I don't think that they got to that were on uh, Stephen's list, um, but I know that there were also some that were, uh, they at least made an attempt to resolve the issue, so. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, any further questions from the public? Okay, great, so thank you both. Yeah. Um, we are going to um, adjust our schedule here a little bit because uh, I know there's some folks here for some items that are not listed until uh, a little later, um, so we're going to um, uh, skip over uh, a couple of the, the following items, the combined sewer overflow as well as the water resource recovery facility. And not cancel, just skip. Just oh, I'm sorry. Reshuffle. We're just resh Thank you. We're reshuffling, <laughs> reshuffling. The point is, um, we're going to jump to um, the responsible employer ordinance, um, first public hearing, and then we're going to go um, from there directly into the um, Murray Hill Water Connection Agreement. Um, so um, to that end, um, my hope is that the Responsible Employer Ordinance first public hearing will be relatively short. Um, this is something that we've discussed in uh, previous meetings. So I'm going to officially open the public hearing uh, on this topic. I'm not sure that um, since we've discussed it um, multiple meetings prior, I don't know that there's anything we need to say. There's nothing <coughs> that's changed, Connor, um, from the last uh, draft we had. Um, any comments from council at this point? I, yes. I thought Glenn might have had something that I missed last time, just uh, some, some language. Uh, I do remember there was... Um, it sounded good, Glenn. <laughs> uh, let me find it. Because I, I did see that it, I, I suggested a change and the change is not reflected in this copy. Um, Can I interrupt you? Please. Glenn, is that okay? Um, uh, we did get this vetted by our lawyer, or no? Mm -hmm. We did. And um, he, they didn't make any other further changes to it. Okay. Sorry, go ahead, Glenn. Yeah, I found. Um, what I brought up last time in section, the new section 6-4, uh, to me it feels like there's a redundant uh, reference to the Vermont prevailing wage law, right in the middle of there, uh, which shall effectively incorporate the rates out of the Vermont prevailing wage law applicable to the regional rates for the Montpelier area as calculated in accordance with Vermont's prevailing wage law, including the appropriate. To me it feels like we could take out one of those clauses including the Vermont prevailing wage law. So for example, which shall effectively incorporate the rates, the, let's see, which shall effectively incorporate, skip to, the regional rates for the Montpelier area as calculated in accordance with Vermont's prevailing wage law including the appropriate apprentice classification. <coughs> Did you get that, Crystal? Can you, can you say it one more time? <laughs> yes. So uh, um, I'll read the entirety of Section 6.4 as I propose it. The bidder or proposer and subcontractors under the bidder or proposer must comply with the obligations established by the city for payment of a responsible wage, which shall effectively incorporate the regional rates for the Montpelier area as calculated in accordance with Vermont's prevailing wage law and then it's uh, as it goes, including the appropriate apprentice class classification, et cetera. Right. Can you figure that out? You can hand me this. Okay. Okay. Um, 
uh, uh, Jack. I'm sorry I didn't uh, have a chance to talk to you about this earlier. We're talking about construction contractors here, and I'm curious about other types of contracts that uh, the city has where that might include, might have uh, employees, and whether they should also be uh, covered somehow. Like I remember a couple of years we've had discussion where we've appro been approving the uh, the contract for uh, for the food service at the senior center, and there are probably other other things like that where the city is uh, contracting for services rather than rather than providing it directly. And I wonder if we know how how many. So I, I jobs like that there are and what, what we should do about them. Do I think the key thing here is the financial threshold? Um, $200,000. $200,000 sort of above. So very, most of those service contracts sort of fall under, above that. Um, so it's, I mean, we could look at all contracts that are about that, but the, the construction industry already has the mechanism to do this, whereas some of the others may not. So it was really, I think, I think, not to take Connor's thunder, but I think it's intended for major construction projects, not all of every piece of work we do. We actually scaled it down even more with the latest draft um, to make certain it was workers on the construction site uh, rather than office workers who would have been in the same company, just given the nature of the job. Mm -hmm. I'm going to piggyback on that, though, uh, Jack's comment. Um, is it, I, I mean, I know um, sort of when we started this conversation, we were wondering how many um, projects would have been affected by this. But we, I'm assuming we still don't know that, um, which makes me wonder if it's sort of a, if it's a reasonable question or too, too difficult a question. I don't think it's too difficult a question. Um, we, and we can get that for second reading um, if we haven't got it already. I think the key issue is that, um, I think what, what convinced us was that the state's already following this, uh, mm -hmm. and that the the con you know we don't have a lot of uh, contracts above two hundred thousand dollars. We can get the number, um, but in talking with those contractors, they're pretty much following this yeah. anyways. And just to be fair, I mean, part of my um, reason in asking is just to know what the impact would mm -hmm. be for us. Um, but I also understand too that even if the number is zero. Um, that it still sets a good precedent and it's still worth doing. Um, so, but it, nonetheless, I think that would be an important thing for us to know. Um, so, okay, any, uh, Donna? Well, I still hope that we move forward to go beyond construction work. Yes. Thank you. Yes, I agree. Um, uh, other comments? Yeah, Lauren. <coughs> yeah, I would just echo that as well. I mean, I view this as a great first step and a great thing to put in place and let's not hold it up to let the maybe perfect be the enemy of the good. So great first step, but definitely want to keep this on the, um, you know, looking at how we could broaden this and looking forward to that. Thanks. Great. All right. Any comments from the public? Okay. Um, unless, uh, I don't know. No? Okay. No, it's all good. <laughs> all right. Um, okay, so um, I think what we would need to do is, well, I'm going to officially close the public hearing then. And is there a motion regarding um, setting the date for second reading? I move to schedule this for second reading at our next meeting on November 13th. Second. Um, with the, uh, with Glenn's amendments? Yes. Okay, with Glenn's amendments. Great, just to clarify. Uh, all right, any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Thank you all for I, I, I just want work. to thank everybody. I know we've had four different meetings on this so far, so <laughs> sticking through it, it's some complicated stuff. I've learned a lot myself, and I uh, just want to appreciate everybody's time and attention to it. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Thank you. Um, I'm here on behalf of Murray Hill Homeowners Association. I'm the president. Uh, my name is Eric Bigglestone. Um, some of you are aware of this proposal in a more depth um, than others. We've had our council members at various meetings over the past year or so. Um, this is a discussion that we've had amongst our board for well over probably two years now. 
Um, and real quickly, just to get you up to speed, what got us to where we are today, um, 35 years, roughly 35 years ago when Murray Hill was built um, by the Senecals, um, they decided to build their own water supply through wells um, that they have managed ever since. Um, Ken Senecal has been the, the system's water operator. Um, and a few years ago, he expressed interest in wanting to retire from that duty which left us as a board with a few decisions, um, whether we uh, decide to hire another operator um, through another company, um, or we start to possibly look into connecting to the municipal uh, water system. Um, as that was not an option many, many years ago, but it is an option now. So that's where we are today. Um, it was accelerated last summer, 2018, uh, when our wells underperformed for the first time, I wouldn't say underperformed, but showed some signs of stress. Um, we had to accelerate some maintenance on them, which they bounced back up. Um, but we do feel with Ken retiring um, and having to look elsewhere for those services, which would definitely cost significant amount of money, we felt that it's the best interest of Murray Hill to explore this option of connecting to the city. Um, where we've done, um, you know, all the research and we have all the engineers and you have all the data. Um, I'd like to also add that uh, the city has been nothing but fantastic in all this. The communication, the professionalism um, with Kurt and everybody on his staff, um, as well as Jim. Um, so that's where we are today. Quick introduction. My name is Jim Tringe. I'm a Murray Hill resident and a board member of the Murray Hill Homeowners Association and the, the chair of the Ad Hoc uh, Water System Committee. And I just want to echo um, Eric's comments. Um, Tom McArdle and Kurt Modica are extremely helpful as we explored this process, as well as, as Jack and Connor and their engagement through the process to um, help understand really what our needs are. Um, so uh, the, the other um, the other group that I want to give a lot of credit to is the, the Drinking Water State Revolving Loan Fund, which allowed us to pay for this engineering study. It was, um, it was expensive for a homeowners association to do that, so access to those funds was very helpful. And that's what really got us here today. So um, we appreciate all the hard work that people have put into this, and uh, I think we're, we're, um, we're close to um, a big milestone. Kurt Monica, Deputy Director of Public Works. Um, uh, as Eric and Jim mentioned, we've been working closely on this project for quite some time. I think our first discussions were in September of 2018. Um, we were, had the opportunity to um, help uh, develop the RFP for the engineering and, um, and review those proposals, and then uh, you know, for, fine tune the uh, preliminary engineering report at, <clears throat> at the end. Um, also, our staff has been up to uh, look at the water system. It's been very well maintained, uh, very few leaks up there. Um, we would be, as part of this agreement, taking over responsibility of the infrastructure. Uh, it does include one pump station. Um, currently, our water treatment plant staff operate pump stations, so that would be uh, um, uh, part of their responsibility. And our distribution staff would take over, you know, flushing of the hydrants and uh, any leaks that do develop. Uh, like, but like I said, um, it has been well maintained by Ken over the years, and I do think this is a, a very good um, opportunity for both the city and for Murray Hill. It's uh, I think everybody wins by making this connection. There's a, a revenue stream for the city of approximately forty-six thousand dollars a year. And uh, for Murray Hill, it's a very modest increase in what they currently pay for rates, as well as having um, you know, the reliability of a full city staff to respond to any emergencies. Um, all the costs are, uh, what the city's uh, responsibility is for this agreement is we, um, through the uh, preliminary engineering report, the best options to extend the water main along North College, and that provides some fire protection. It's the only option that provides some fire protection from Murray Hill, um, which hopefully will, you know, reduce their insurance rates a little bit. Um, so the the city, so my goal was to not have to do a, a bond vote in order to make this connection happen. Um, so we'd be looking at extending the North College line uh, to the end of the street 
and securing the easement cross country um, to connect to the Murray Hill system. All of that work would be done in-house by public work staff. Um, the work from uh, the intersection of uh, Town Street to the end of North College would be done by public work staff. From there, it would be Murray Hills contractor to connect to their water system. So um, the investment for the city is relatively small. I think it's, you know, I was thinking in material costs, you know, somewhere between, um, you know, somewhere around $20,000 $20, or so. Um, <clears throat> So, like I said, I think this is a win for everybody. Uh, what we're asking for tonight is the council to authorize the city manager to approve the agreement that was submitted in the council packets, um, which really details the responsibility of the city and Murray Hill. And uh, there'll be a separate, um, we'd come back uh, to the council at a later date to actually take acceptance of the water system once we've verified that all of the, um, the work identified in that agreement is complete. Any questions? Well, I'm, so I have a question. Um, so there's a, a pump house um, on uh, that you all, that Murray Hill has currently, is that correct? And uh, I noticed one of the th um, uh, provisions in the agreement um, has you all updating that or bringing it up to code. I assume that w um, once it's up to code that the city would take over, like, this is sort of a, what you were just saying, right, that um, uh, the city would end up take over running that pump station. Is that more or less correct? Yep, that's correct. After we, after that, so right now, um, all of our water pump stations are connected to our computer monitoring systems. <coughs> so that's part of the upgrades that need to be done, but radio communications so we can sort of monitor that um, station remotely. Um, but yes, yeah, so ultimately that would become a part of the city's infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, any other questions? Um, so uh, it was funny that we, you know, we were planned to have this presentation happen right after a presentation on um, the water and sewer uh, finances, <laughs> which caused a lot of uh, you know deep breathing on my part. Um, so, <laughs> uh, in any case, having. Um, Having this uh, this you know prospect, I think, makes a lot of sense for us, um, and and hopefully for you all as well. Uh, or it sounds like it does make make sense for you all as well. Um, so I'm in, inclined to um, be in favor uh, of it. I, I think there are some questions that are related to the water system that I'll save for that conversation. Um, but uh, but f as, but for, as for this proposal, I I think it seems great. Other thoughts? Um, yes. Oh, I was just going to make a motion. Oh, go for it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, so I move to approve the U water system construction, dedication, and water supply agreement and designate the city manager as the duly authorized agent to execute documents on behalf of the city of Montpelier. A second. Further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, great. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah, yeah for sure. Thank you. Okay, so um, we're going to jump back in the agenda. Um, it's about 8.30. Um, do you, how are you all doing? Do you want another break? Are you feeling okay? We're feeling good? Okay, great. Um, so we're going to uh, jump back to the um, combined sewer water overflow financials, and we'll go as far as we can, but I'm, I have a feeling we're going to end up um, uh, canceling item 15, the um, Chapter 8 public hearing. Um, I wonder if you want to go to the um, water system financials first before CSO. There is a PowerPoint for the CSO financials that's a little bit longer. I think the, um, the water sewer financials we can go through a little bit faster if you that's want. That's fine with me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, okay, so we're going to go to the, you said the water sewer uh, financials then? Right. Okay. Do you need uh, any time to, you know, connect to the projector or anything? Um, I mean, I do have a couple of slides. I don't think I necessarily have to do a PowerPoint for this unless you really want one. But. Well, it's, it's it, I mean, I know we all have the slides yeah, available. Pages in our packet. Um, so right. the teeniest, so. tiniest numbers. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I mean, we've got it if you need to refer to anything, so. Okay. So this is number item 11 now? Yes. Uh, oh, no, um, 12. 12. 12. Keep up Water, okay. I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying. So many changes. Slide of hand. I'm 12. Okay, so um, so the, the 
The guiding document for utility replacements is the Water Sewer Master Plan. Uh, that was developed in 2016. Uh, it really um, outlines all the funding and the goals for um, the length of pipe that we replace each year. And that is to achieve a steady state um, condition where uh, essentially every pipe in the entire city is replaced over a 100 year period. And um, you know, one thing I wanted to do tonight is to you know sort of um, show where we're at on that plan. How, you know, are we meeting our targets? And um, on the on the handout I provided to you, I did um, omit one water project, and we were just slightly under our goal of 1,100 feet uh, for the last three years. Um, as uh, Cumming Street, there the state is um, rebuilding the bridge on Cumming Street, and there is a water line about 135 feet associated with that. So when you add that in, we actually are uh, just above our target um, <laughs> of 1,100 feet. So um, that's good news. We are uh, we are hitting uh, what we set out to hit uh, for water line replacement. Can, can I ask you a question about that? I'm sure. sorry. I could save we could save all the questions to the end. That's okay. No, go ahead. Um, okay. I recall from uh, presentations from Tom McArdle that the uh, lines that are largely breaking right now are not the oldest ones. They are the ones that sort of were installed in the 70s or so, something like that. Um, when we go to replace uh, just so many miles, uh, so many feet uh, per year, we're, are, hmm, is there any way that we are targeting the uh, piping that is prone to break? Or are we just saying, anything on this street, ready, go? <laughs> Uh, no, it's absolutely uh, worst first condition. So it's actually the so that yes, you're correct. Uh, a lot of the pipes that were put in the 90s were constructed of ductile iron, and um, at the time of the installation, it, it wasn't known how susceptible they were to corrosive soils. So those are a lot of the pipes that are failing now are, are ductile iron that are just um, you know 30 years old. So if if I can follow up on that, so I I also recall that you know some of the piping that was like 100 years old is still somehow fine, or is that? Right. So the 100 year old pipes were a cast iron material and um, they're almost an inch thick, so they you know, just very robust piping. Um, and yeah, those do not are not failing at the rate that we're seeing uh, of the newer ductile iron pipe. Um, I realize this is maybe a ridiculous question, but the uh, the piping that we're putting in now, when we replace it, right? We're, it's we're replacing ductile iron with PVC. Is that right? Mm. Um, we were using PVC for the first few years of replacement. Uh, we just recently um, changed our water pipe standard to an HDPE. So it's a high density polyethylene. It's also plastic, um, but it also has um, it, it, we believe is going to have a longer design life, and it's also a little bit elastic, so it can kind of absorb some pressure shock, shocks from the system. So this is the ridiculous part of my question. Um, uh, it's, it's unreasonable, right, to think that we could ever like be installing something that's going to have a hundred-year lifespan, right? Like this. No, we do believe that iron. the HTB, HDPE will match the cast iron lifespan. Okay. We okay. Do. I mean, so we're, we're hopeful. Don't know yet. Yeah. just to put in here, if, if we're going for a steady state and replacing all of our piping once entirely over a 100-year period, do I understand that correctly? That's like, correct, yeah. Then, then we should assume that some of our pipe is going to be 100 years old by the time it gets replaced, right? Which like it already seems, is, yeah. Right. So I think, I think we have to, to hope that... Uh, HDP, at least some of it, will last something like 100 years if we if we want to, like if we're going for like no breakages, that's what we would want. But there's there's no way that we could. There's somehow I I I worry about plastics. I'm just yep. gonna say it. Yep. I worry about plastics in general, um, and their interaction with unexpected chemicals that we may ever have flowing through our pipes um, or being mixed in with our soils. Um, and the cast iron, for some reason, I'm like, oh yeah, that, that's stable. That's <laughs> fine. Um, but there's no way we're going back to cast iron pipes. Well, they don't make it anymore, so we can't get it. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> it's just expensive. OK, thank you for indulging me in my ridiculous Are they too expensive? questions. No, they don't make cast iron pipe anymore. Oh. The, the only metal pipe is really ductile. Mm. Mm -hmm. 
Why? Uh, I don't. I think it's, it's speaking it's from production the place costs. Of it was so thick. You know the <laughs> the cost cheap of Cheap plastics. Yeah, yeah. Cheap plastics came in, pushed them out. So nobody just nobody makes it. <laughs> okay. Um, Lauren, you had a question. Uh, yeah, you might have just answered it. So just trying to get a sense of the alternatives. Also being concerned with plastic as the substance, knowing we're learning more and more about the chemicals. And I mean, I think HDPE is like one of the better plastics in terms of toxicity, but um, certainly better than PVC. But um, just like what were our options and something that maybe, I presume it's the cheapest with the best performance kind of characteristics or for what you were looking for. Just curious what the yeah. options were. So really there's, there's three water pipe options on the market. It's ductile iron, PVC, or HDPE. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> the advantages of HTPE is uh, it's actually fused pipe, so it's actually melted together as opposed to uh, the other two styles of pipe are a gasket and spigot. And um, there's actually an allowable leakage for all of those gasketed connections. So you're always going to have lost water with that type of pipe. So that's another advantage of the HTPE. There is zero leakage because there is no joint there. Um, the other um, benefits are, like I mentioned, um, it, it is expandable a little bit, and um, it's flexible, so you don't need as much concrete um, at sharp corners to keep the pipe in place. Um, we do um, <coughs> see, we do soil testing before we install the pipe to uh, make sure there's not going to be any issues with the uh, backfill material around it. Um, and it is, from our research, uh, the only pipe that we think is going to get a 100-year design life. The PVC, I think most of the estimates are around 70 years. The ductile, we're getting 30, so I don't really want to do that. You can, you can do a plastic wrapped ductile iron, and they also have a um, galvanized ductile iron option. Um, those are both uh, fairly expensive. Uh, HDP is also uh, an expensive pipe. Um, it is. It does cost a little bit more, but um, for the benefits that I just mentioned, we think that it's worth the investment. Um, what are the? I, I've heard that um, some folks being um, perturbed about. That's probably the wrong phrase. Fr frustrated, maybe about. Uh, there was some incident where there was new pipe being installed, and maybe it was for the fusing process. They ended up with some kind of um, outgassing in their house, and they had to not not be in their house. Was that because of the fusing process? No, that was um, sewer uh, lining, oh, okay. which is That's also part of the steady state. Something I wanted to talk to uh, you folks tonight about yeah. as well. So right, I know. Topic. I know. We're just like we're just talking <laughs> questions right now, um, okay. but that. But that's a different process, right? Or it's a it's a uh, epoxy lining inside an existing sewer pipe, as opposed to installing a new plastic okay. water main. Okay. So, okay. Thank you. Um, thank you for letting me detour and ask no some questions. Um, please carry on. <laughs> okay. Um, so, like I said, we're on target for our, our water system replacement schedule. Um, sewer is actually a little bit behind, and there's a few reasons for that. Um, one is uh, we were a little bit unsure of the finances of the wastewater plant, so um, a little bit cautious on uh, how much money we spent. Um, things are looking better now on that front, so that's good news. And uh, the other part of it is um, we are we we had a fairly extensive lining contract. Like we were just talking about this epoxy lining inside sewers. It's a very cost-effective way to replace. Um, to rehabilitate sewers, it's not a replacement. Um, obviously, the downsides that we learned from the project is one that um, it, it it does have an odor. It's um, it's styrene is the uh, the material that's off gas. Um, it smells like Bondo for those who've done mechanic work or body work on your car. Um, so there are alternatives that we're looking into. So we, we had a, a fairly extensive contract, and when we had that issue with the with the odors, and, and the reason those residents had odors in their house is because they don't have traps on their um, sewer service from the from their house. 
which in itself is um, is concerning, and so we certainly recommend recommended to them that they have that corrected. Um, but if it was constructed with a trap on it, I don't think we would have experienced this, uh, that sort of issue. Um, but regardless, we're looking at other alternatives. They do have an, an alternate material to styrene, which is, um, I can't remember the chemical name off the top of my head, but um, we're looking at that as a, a potential alternative. So, when, and the second part or issue with lining is you have to have a very uniform pipe. You, uh, a lot of our pipes will go from six inch to four inch to eight and all sorts of things. And the liner has to it has to have a uniform pipe to, um, to expand into. So it's steam cured. Uh, it's this epoxy that goes sort of inside out inside the pipe and then they um, force steam in and adhere it to the uh, walls of the sewer pipe. Um, like I said, you can get a lot of production. It's, it's not disruptive to um, you know, the road, you don't have to dig anything up. Um, but we've got to work through um, this, um, this uh, off-gas concern. And like I said, there are alternatives to the styrene. So I think once we, once we are able to fine-tune how we bid and how we uh, pre-inspect um, our sewer lines, we're really going to be able to make some great progress on, um, on our sewer replacement. And every time we, so the, the sewer mains are clay tile pipes. Those pipes have no gaskets in them. So they uh, act as a street under drain, essentially. So, and, um, you know, water can, if the groundwater comes up over those pipes, they go right into the sewer and then that, you know, contributes to our CSO issue. Um, so we're sort of doing two things at once when we are sealing these pipes up. We're helping reduce our CSOs as well as preserving the asset. Um, I have another question about mm -hmm. that. Um, clay tile pipe, this is used in sewer systems. Correct. But it's not an appropriate material for water systems? No, it's not a pressure pipe, so it wouldn't hold up to the... Got you. Yeah, 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 okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Mm -hmm. um, so like I said, that's sort of how our plan to catch up on, on sewer is, is really refine this, this lining technique. Uh, it's cost effective as well as uh, minimal, minimally disruptive. A um, couple other things um, to sort of... Um, show that we're doing maybe a little bit better than just the hard numbers show. Um, we really look at uh, asset divestment, which is uh, we looked at streets that have two water mains and we replace them with one. So not only are you putting you know a new thousand feet of pipe in, but you're taking away a thousand. So it actually gets us to steady state even that much quicker. And that pipe, that second pipe, doesn't have to be replaced. Um, so it's, a, it's an added benefit or added accelerated schedule. So there's a couple streets that's happened. Norfield Street had su two sewer mains, and um, Clarendon Ave that we're doing this year had um, two sewer mains and two water mains. And so we're replacing those with, with just one. Um, a couple other planning documents that we've done. We've uh, just completed um, the roof drain study. That was through uh, the Lake Champlain Basin Program grant, sort of looking at what roof drains are tied, and that's more related to the CSO, but it is sort of fall under the sewer fund. Um, and then the, um, the long-term control plan, which is also, um, it's very specific to CSOs, um, but we were able to get that 50% funded, 50% uh, of our staff time reimbursed for that work. And of course, we've got the plant upgrade, so that's um, you know, taking some a fair amount of effort from the public work staff. And now this Murray Hill connection agreement that y'all just approved, um, you know that is going to offer allow us to have some additional funding to hopefully accelerate water replacements a little bit moving forward. Any questions? I have lots of questions. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, unless you, okay. uh, Jack, go ahead. I've heard from people who've uh, who've had to do construction or plumbing work that there are places out there in the city where we don't actually know where the mains or the branches of the houses are. Uh, is that right? Um, so for we have a, a very good um, record system of water services. And those also can be traced. We have equipment that can actually put a current through the water line and follow it out to the main. Mm 
Um, sewer is quite different. We have um, essentially no record on sewer services. A lot of the old ones run right with the water in the same trench, the older houses. Um, and I think part of that is the ownership of sewer services is private all the way to the connection of the main uh, by ordinance, as opposed to the water that the city owns it up to the right-of-way line. So there's a difference there. It, it, it is true. We don't have great records on, on sewer services unless it's you know, in the last you know, 20 years when record keeping has been you know, much improved. Um, but the water, the pressure line, we can, we can locate it if we don't have the record, but we have record on almost all of them. Okay, thanks. This is a little bit of a personal story, but we found one of your sewer tops um, when we were digging in our garden with all this plant moving at my condo building. Yeah, and you didn't know it existed. It had been buried for 30 years <laughs> under dirt. Uh, yeah, so now you know that one. Yeah, your contractor came and told me, and we, I think we and went you, and GPS it. And unfortunately, yeah. now you want to keep it open, so now we can't put our bush back. <laughs> I wish we hadn't told you. <laughs> but you took the lid off and looked in and said, oh, it's working fine. <laughs> oh, Lord. Um, just curious, knowing that this plan is very forward-looking at the next 100 years, um, and knowing that with climate change and, you know, so what might have been the given a few years ago of conditions we know is changing and accelerating, like how much um, kind of climate resilience or considerations of the impacts on this, and maybe it's also or as pertinent in some of the other uh, infrastructure conversations we're about to have, but just curious how much that's part of the kind of planning and forward-looking and projecting of um, what you all are doing, or is that part of conversations moving forward? Um, well, I think our, our pipe choice is probably going to be, um, you know, very resilient for climate change as far as water systems. Um, you know, I think w when we developed the master plan, it was, it was really, you know, developed fairly simply through this is the cost for, for replacement and, and, you know, most of the time you can only get 100 years out of the pipe. So um, I don't think you know, we didn't necessarily take that into account, climate change into account, when we developed the master plan. But uh, as we um, select materials for the actual piping replacements, you know, I think um, that does come into play for the resiliency of HDPE. So, um, Lauren, I, that your phrase there is very optimistic. It's a forward-looking plan. Um, I <laughs> see this as like we are not funding things at the appropriate levels um, currently, and we've planned to take 50 years to get to the point where we are funding them at appropriate levels. Um, is that, I, I think that's kind of a fair, like to get to steady state, like we're, we're not funding them at the, at the levels they should be pre presently. Is that a fair statement? Um, well, I mean, I'd, I, if you wanted to increase water rates, we would replace more water mains Absolutely. Um, uh, as far as like, as far as leaks, um, you know, just to sort of give you, we've had um, a, you know a fair amount of leaks this year. But uh, looking at our operating budget, it's essentially on target. We're not really, we're a, li a little bit over in distribution. The plants, water plants, a little bit under. So we're actually, if you look at the overall fund, we're slightly under, um, you know, percentage of time versus uh, percentage of budget used. Um, it, it is hard on our crews, more so in the winter, uh, to deal with these water leaks. It, you know, I think it would be nice to, um, to take care of all the problematic water mains up front. The problem is the, um, you know, the ductile iron that's failing, um, it's appropriately sized, as opposed to the older pipes that are not failing as much. Those are undersized for fire flows. So we have competing requirements. We've got these new pipes that are <laughs> that are failing that are the right size. So um, <laughs> I just want also wanted to point out, um, you know, the, we had, we did have, uh, as you all are aware, Nelson Street washed out twice in the last six months. One of the, one of those times uh, was in the winter, and it was you know a pretty um, catastrophic event causing icing downtown. Um, again, just uh, a month ago it happened. So. Um, we did um, hire a contractor sort of as an emergency repair project to do that section of water main. 
Uh, it was ductile iron um, put in in the 70s. It was probably some of the very first ductile iron, I think, that went in the city. Um, where they originally looked to connect, um, uh, the pipe actually you could peel the outer layer of it off. Mm -hmm. So it was really bad. They went down another eight feet and the pipe was solid. So um, that those washouts um, and re complete repaving of Nelson, that's like $20,000. So there's there can be cases of significant uh, damage, but um, the water fund pays for that damage. It does not come out of the general fund. Just wanted to make that distinction. Mm -hmm. And um, we haven't paid the paving bill yet, uh, but um, we are, like I said, still uh, within our budget for um, operating. So uh, will you be replacing that again um, with the HDPE? Um, so the HDP, we didn't, we use PVC on that particular installation and the reason is um, because the HDPE is, um, it's um, elastic, you have to put um, restraints to keep it from sort of shrinking and growing and being <coughs> 130 feet of replacement pipe, and that was the, the last remaining section of Ridge Street that we had to replace, um, the cost and the time associated with those restraints, uh, it wasn't cost effective. So. In certain cases, we do uh, make exceptions and use uh, PVC as opposed to HTP. Um, uh, so, looking at the uh, the graph that you have, it's sideways um, yeah. of the uh, debt service uh, over time. So, um, you might want to be aware of that. When you put something sideways in your presentation, <laughs> that's how we see it. Okay. Right. Sorry about that. Uh, so I had understood that uh, the water system had some significant bonds that were being paid down and that we were going to be crossing some kind of, um, you know, some nice milestone threshold <clears throat> um, in the upcoming years, you know, 2021 or two or so. Um, in which we were going to pay off a substantial bond. Um, and so just looking at this debt service, it's a little hard to tell because um, there's uh, the uh, additional contracted uh, water services that sort of uh, jumps up in 2023. But is, is that a correct um, understanding that we, and, and if so, is does that, paying down of some significant bond show up in this graph? Um, yep, so the, I think probably the major bond you're referring to is the water plant. Mm -hmm. That is um, complete in fiscal year 25. Okay. Um, we have taken on uh, a, f a few bonds in just recent years. We've done Northfield Street as well as um, uh, the Clarendon Avenue and a couple other streets that were lumped in with that one. So, you know, as that comes off, we've been adding debt back on. So it, it is a w out in the out years, I think, you know, like, they, like you said, that graph does illustrate it. FY39 sort of jumps up a bit. Um, so, I mean, without, and like I, like I mentioned, this, this master plan is developed with a, you know, a moderate proposed rate increase for rate payers of three and a half percent annually which is, you know, two and a half of that is inflation with one, one percent increase. Um, yeah, the financing is a limiting factor for how fast we can replace pipes, but, um, you know, the idea behind this was to make it palatable to the water rate users. Uh, I'm not opposed to, to looking at this and possibly accelerating it. If the council wants to do that, um, we're all for it, but, um, you know, I just, we just have to, you know, think about the impacts to the, the water rate payers, as you're aware. Yep. Um, so when we pay off that bond in 2025, um, theoretically that would free up some capacity or some f some funding, really, um, to put either potentially be more proactive about replacing lines or um, to deal with the unexpected breaks. I mean, one just assumption, right, is that with climate change, we're gonna see more breaks over time. Um, just in terms of like the freeze-thaw cycles and being more extreme and, um, and that, that sort of thing. So um, I, I guess my sense of um, wanting to push on this is um, 
is it really just in anticipation of um, the potential for more um, basically breaks happening and like how I, I know that's like impossible to to really predict like where is it going to break and so you know it's you're sort of playing whack-a-mole a little bit um, and you know you're going to we're going to intentionally replace you know this one street over here but that's not the one that that breaks um, um, but anyway I'm not is there any uh, I guess my, my question is is there any um, way to if, if we were going to replace lines faster um, than the projected rate, um, is would that end up saving us money, or is it really not worth it because there's so many miles and it's so unpredictable? Mm -hmm. um, well, part of the problem is that water main replacement is extremely expensive. So in FY23, we're looking at doing East State Street. Um, lots of buildings, uh, busy street. You know, it's going to be well over a million dollars just for the water portion of that project. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing that we are cons are starting to look at is um, trenchless rehabilitation of lines, and that's pro possibly a good alternative for ductile iron pipe that has failed early because um, for a system like that, you really want the pipe to be the correct size. Um, what does that mean, trenchless? So it would be similar to a different material chemical than the sewer lining but a similar technique where you don't dig anything up um, you put a liner on the inside of the pipe um, through a hydrant or something like that mm -hmm. um, I've never I don't have any personal experience with it but it's something we're looking at that could be a, a more cost-effective alternative to accelerate pipe replacements okay, okay. Um, cool thanks um, other questions no? okay um, I know I'm sure you thought this was going to be a, a short one, and I'm sorry that we <laughs> okay. made it longer. Um, I think those are all of my questions at this point. Um, but just you know, in thinking about like how do we prepare? Is there anything that we should be doing differently in order to prepare for the possibility of more breaks? Um, well, so those big picture ideas. There's a couple, couple of thoughts we've had. Um, you know, one is the city of Montpelier has really, really high pressures, and that's part of the reason we have so many leaks and, mm -hmm. and the reason why they're so destructive when they do leak, because um, you have 200 pounds of pressure you know, <laughs> blasting out roads. Um, so city of Barrie, for example, has a high and a low pressure system. Um, we need a high pressure line to get to our tanks that will serve Murray Hill and other areas. Um, but we don't need all the downtown to be at 200 pounds of pressure. So, you know, one thought is, and this, you know, this would be potentially tens of millions of dollars. I don't know. <laughs> but as long as we're we we'll could, save us money. <laughs> you would need a, a dual pipe system, you know, through the downtown to get to the tanks, to the hills. Yeah. Um, a complete redesign of the system to drop all the pressures in the downtown. Um, to a reasonable level. That's one big picture idea. Um, another sort of less big picture, but uh, something that I want to explore is having some relief valves. There's little spikes in the system. Um, those spikes can you know, bounce from one end to the other, and, and that's what results in these breaks. If we could relieve those spikes with some pressure relief valves uh, in different areas strategically, uh, we might be able to reduce the number of leaks. It's not a cure-all, but it um, could give us some time. It makes sense to me. Um, yeah. I wonder how expensive that is. That's affordable. I don't. I mean, I think um, I would want. I would probably need to hire some engineering work out on that, and um, you know, I would guess in the fifty to one hundred thousand dollar range. Okay. To, to get it all done. Cool. Thank you. I know I had a lot of questions there, but um, any other questions? Any questions from the public? Lauren? Just just one other thing, since you said you are sometimes using PVC piping, I was just on the um, HIPPE website, National Institutes of Health, um, where they're talking about the chemicals that are part of PVC that they add to make it more flexible, um, phthalates, dioxins, BPA, and you know those are linked to cancers, infertility, um, it changes in your hormones, and extremely low levels of these chemicals can impact public health. So just hope that the <coughs> department is looking at potential public health implications. And if we're looking at things like epoxy linings or new things, that just the um, 
you know, knowing both we don't want to be harming the health of our people or, you know, we realize, oh, we put this stuff in and then in 15 years we want to tear it all out because we feel like it's a public health risk. So just trying to think long term of what we're putting in. Great. Any other, anyone else? Okay. Thank you so much. Um, we're actually going to take a um, quick detour um, in our agenda. I know we had, um, had Chapter 8, uh, Animals, first public hearing, at the end, but we're actually going to move it to right now, for your sake. All right, Chapter 8. Um, so this is the, um, I'm going to officially open the public hearing. Um, I'm doing really well at that today. Um, on on uh, chapter eight, animals and uh, fowl. So I think we have some better language this time around. Any comments from the public? Great. Any comments from council? Okay, super. I agree. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, I'm going to officially close the public hearing, um, and I think uh, we need a motion to set the, um, uh, yeah, you know what I mean, set the, the reading for the next meeting. I move to set the second public hearing on this uh, Chapter 8 amendment for our next, uh, our next meeting. A second. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thanks for coming down for that. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> fair point. That's fair point. Not to put too <laughs> Okay. All right. So, all right. So now um, we're gonna um, jump back into. Well, okay. It's it's nine o'clock. Um, mm -hmm. We have yet to cover CSOs, the uh, water resource recovery facility. Those two things. I'm gonna guess that. I don't know if we can do both. Do you think we can do both in that time? Just the way that the conversation's been going, I feel like we probably can only do one. I don't know, what's your, you what's your thought? <laughs> yeah. Uh, are we keeping you both here, one for each of those? I'm for CSO by hand, he's here for both, so. Okay. Let's do CSOs then, okay. <laughs> you don't have to. You don't have to read every slide. You can give us the <laughs> overview points, assuming we've read your slides. OK, so um, we're going to talk a little bit about CSO financials. Um, assume everyone knows what a CSO is. Uh, if there's a couple new council members, I'll just give you a, just a quick background. Um, combined sewer overflows, the uh, city's sewer and storm systems were all built uh, with one pipe originally. Um, in 62, they had the interceptor project that came through, took the um, took all those pipes and brought them to the plant. But when that was done, um, these structures, tw I think 23 of them around the city were built so that when the rains came and went into the, the combined system, um, the, those pipes became overloaded and a certain percentage of the water in those pipes um, goes straight to the river. Um, since that time, we've gotten down to um, six structures. So this this financial plan is um, is modeled after really this whole presentation is from what's called a long-term control plan, which was a, a state mandated through our wastewater permit, um, basically a financing plan to um, eliminate CSOs. Um, that's um, like I said, part of our um, sewer discharge permit through what's called a, a 1272 order. So, so these um, these financials also are tied to the sewer master plan. Um, that is the that is the funding source for CSO elimination work, is through the sewer fund. Um, you know, this first slide illustrates the locations of the remaining CSOs. Uh, two of them are siphon lines, which um, are used to carry the, uh, the combined flows across the river, um, one across the North Branch and one across the Winooski. Um, those are, uh, that's part of our bottleneck, really, is that those have a, a finite capacity. Um, and we do have some um, some ideas on how to increase the capacities on those. I have a couple questions. Sure. Of course. 
Uh, so um, I was a little confused uh, by this image only because uh, I was not totally clear on what the blue dots versus the red dots meant. So the, the blue dots are the siphons um, where they're coming across, and all the red dots are the, uh, the CSO overflows. And what are the yellow stars or whatever? Oh, the yellow, or the yellow dots are all of our sewer structures within the city. So that's our entire sewer network. Um, do you mean like those are like... Manholes. Manholes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, those are at like access points. Um, uh, forgive my ignorance. Can you describe... Uh, I mean, I think I understand a combined sewer water overflow point. I feel like I understand what that means. With the siphon, what is happening there? So um, a siphon is, um, um, I don't know how to explain it well, but there's a structure on one side of the river that's just a little bit higher than the outlet on the other side of the river. And once that has a full column of water, it essentially, as opposed to pumping, <laughs> it pulls the water under the river and then back up to the other side because of the <coughs> elevation difference. Oh, okay, okay. So it's an alternative to a pump station so you don't have uh, power use. Okay. To Does um, that that portion then after the siphon? It depends on. Um, it depends on the. I'm sorry. The height of the river. Then does that matter, or it's going? It's going under the river. Right. It goes under okay. the river. So it's um, the 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 velocity is dictated by the size of the pipe and the difference in elevations from one the high side of the river to the lower side of the river. Okay. The crossing. Okay, that is helpful, thank you. So when it gets across the river, where does it go? And then it goes back into a gravity um, collection system and eventually down to the plant. Okay. okay. All right, so, so this map here shows you for in 2018 all of the overflow events that we had at each of the individual structures. Um, so that is just a general overview of what occurred last year. Uh, if I go to the next slide here, this is uh, through our long-term control plan, we had to come up with an approach of how we were going to eliminate our CSOs. And uh, this is generally what we uh, found as the best way for Montpelier uh, to eliminate uh, CSOs and, um, and all. So our, our first step is to adjust weirs and the siphons where applicable. Uh, by adjusting the elevation of the weir, you can you gain more capacity, more uh, basically uh, head. And the more, the higher the elevation, the more uh, flow can actually increase velocity that goes through the pipe. Um, so then you have a, a bigger capacity. So we've already gone through a series of changes uh, back in 2016. Was the first set of them. Um, so we've adjusted, we've done some incremental changes uh, because if you go too high, you can have some problems with uh, the connecting services. Uh, so if you bring an elevation above where the sewer service connects, it will backflow potentially into a, a house or a business. Um, so we've done incremental changes there um, so that we can uh, make sure that we don't cause any other problems by just adjusting it too high. Um, in addition, we are currently looking at installing uh, flow monitors uh, and rain gauges that will give us more precise data um, in each of the locations um, for each CSO. Uh, the, our most recent CSO event that we had, uh, we only had, it was um, at the plant, which is our, where our current rain gauge is, uh, we had 0.3 inches of rain. But when we looked at the in the weather station up at the airport, there was for the same day like 1.6 inches. So we do experience some localized showers. Um, so we need to make sure that we can have the right instruments in order to to provide accurate data about how to best eliminate these. Uh, so that's something that we're moving forward through uh, this year. Um, hopefully, we there's a, a round of funding um, that we're trying to take advantage of currently. Um, in addition, uh, we're performing smoke testing, which is we put we issue smoke into the system um, where we can look and find um, 
uh, possible cross connections. Um, so we did that on we do we did that on Clarendon, and we've done that in um, that neighborhood. Um, we did that also in Deerfield Greenfield to confirm that there were um, no connections, like roof drain connections, into the sewer system um, that we were missing prior to paving the street. Um, in addition, we want to preserve pipe assets. Kurt was just talking about this uh, through uh, the contract of you know the the steam curing of the sewer lines. Uh, that we did that trial project uh, earlier this year, and it was successful in terms of rehabilitating the line. But we also had a, a lot of other problems that uh, were that we didn't really uh, that we that were unexpected when we first uh, bid out the the project. Um, in addition to preserving pipe assets, really our approach is to take what we currently have and improve it rather than, uh, I mean, we could add more pump stations or come up with some really creative engineering designs, but that doesn't preserve, we still have that asset. So we have a 36 inch trunk line that goes uh, from Bailey Ave all the way down to the plant. Um, and that trunk line needs to be uh, preserved, it needs to be kept in good condition. So while there are some other options that could maybe impact uh, the CSOs, um, it doesn't take into account the asset. So our approach is kind of a dual approach, improve the asset and the capacity at which the, the wastewater moves through it. So uh, our trunk line is generally around 7 million gallons. So, you know, our goal through lining is to get it around 9 to 10 million gallons. Um, so we have this approach of preserving what we have first. Um, and then if, if we can't eliminate them in entirety, then looking at some other options like flow reduction and treatment um, if they cannot if, it, if uh, overflows cannot be completely eliminated. In addition, we also have the roof drains uh, through the report that Kurt was talking about um, that in areas where we can hopefully disconnect and eliminate those uh, contributing volumes. Just to follow up on the, on the asset replacement. So um, of the existing pipes, the main pipes that carry the sewer to the plant are constructed out of a concrete. So by putting an epoxy lining you, you make that pipe much smoother, and therefore you can carry more flows. So the plant really isn't restricted in capacity. Well, it has a, a 12 million gallon per day um, capacity. We never we never can get enough flow to the plant. Um, so if we can if we can at the same time, like Zach was saying, um, extend the life of the sewer and increase the capacity. That's that's the best way to go about this because um, the plant can handle those those flows if we can just get it there. So that's sort of how we're looking at um, um, so, so back to when you were talking about flow reduction or treatment, is that if because there's some engineering challenge with the CSOs, or is that a budget if we don't kind of have the money to do it? What, why would we do that instead of eliminating them? Or is that like an interim until we get to them? Or can you just explain that a little more? Yes, yeah, so one of the options um, through the, the state CSO rule is to actually treat the wastewater that overflows to the river, and so it would be, it would, you could treat it. So, but it would require screening. It's defined as screening and disinfection at the point of discharge. So we would have six overflows that we would potentially have to have, you know, either chlorination and detention time or ultraviolet disinfection, as well as some sort of screening unit. So it's listed last because we don't really want to go that route. Um, very expensive, uh, difficult to achieve, and. Um, and really not the best solution in our opinion. So it, it is listed on here as an alternative, but it's not something that we're planning to proceed with or move forward with. Sorry to follow up on that. Do, do you anticipate at this point that any of the CSO points will fall into that category of like that, you, that we cannot eliminate them? At this time, uh, having written the long-term control plan, or the, at least the draft document, uh, we don't think that okay. um, there might be that 100-year storm that we couldn't quite capture. But uh, we have a most of our issues are capacity-based. And if we can get, if we can improve it by, say, 140%, so if it was six, if we can get it to 9 million gallons, that captures everything that we've had this year, everything we had last year, everything we've had you know, the previous year. Um, 
So it's not necessarily a matter of, I mean, I think of combined sewer water overflow points as like, you know, sort of being, at least having um, some kind of part of it that's open, right? That like, if it overflows, it just goes out into the world. Um, so this would be not necessarily just closing off. It's not just a matter of like cutting off that opening, so to speak, but rather like just increasing the size of the piping. So eventually we would have, so these are, um, there's like a little wall next to the sewer main, and when the water level comes up in the sewer main, it goes over that wall right, to the river there. So ultimately, the goal is to block those those uh, openings those opening, up. Yeah. Um, but if we do that before we reduce the flows in the pipe, then that goes into people's houses. And so that's like a, a higher health risk. So that's the only other place it could exit, or out in the street. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so so just to be clear, <laughs> if we were able to get rid of all the CSOs and we had a major, um, event, then um, sewer water could back up into people's homes. Well, okay. so, well, okay. <laughs> one sure caveat on that. Um, if we closed all the CSOs. If we closed all, if we did if we too early. all the CSOs, so, that's possible. So, you know, item two on the list is install flow monitors. So there's grant funding. We're going to try to get those in, hopefully in the spring. Um, we're hopefully going to get funding for it this year before the end of the calendar year. But that will tell us how much water is going over, and we can predict the higher storms okay. to tell us, you know. Cool. All right. Thank you. That we're good. Yeah. Just anticipating, you know, when, when I get the next email that's like, why didn't you fix these CSOs? I mean, well, <laughs> you know, you close them all right now. <laughs> Here's what can happen. All right. Sorry. Anyway. So I don't. We don't really need to touch on this slide all too much because we, you guys just talked about it and went over it in your other uh, water sewer discussion, so we can skip over this one. A lot of money. So I'm actually going to jump ahead to the next slide. This is just a graph of the funding that we anticipate in order to resolve each of um, the CSOs uh, within some year category years and the amount of money that is associated with each of those years. So here, for each of the CSOs, we've listed a range of options uh, through our long-term control plan, and uh, it's kind of spelled out here. Uh, I can give you a minute to look at it if you want and ask some questions. Um, each CSO is different, and some of them, they're in order to, so for instance, uh, CSO number 23, which is the, sewer, the, the last one, the sewer siphon um, that is over by Bailey Avenue. Um, we may need to do some other things in order to fully eliminate them. So there's some phases and increments that need to happen, um, like such as you know cleaning and supplying the the trunk line that goes from Bailey Ave to the plant. So by increasing that the flow from that point to the plant, then you can then increase the next step down the line. So um, there's not a very there's not a set order of these projects, but there's a general idea of uh, how we can approach these and and the the money that it's going to take uh, to achieve uh, each of these projects. I will say that one of the, one of the biggest projects that we have right now on the docket after the installation of these monitors is that there is a it's a there's a sag line in um, on State Street. So over past Taylor Street, the sewer main takes a dip and goes down and comes back up. And that's really restricting our flows that are able to get to the plant. Um, we don't know yet when we eliminate that sag how much benefit we're going to have. We're pretty hopeful that um, we will see a, a good, a really high reduction in overflow events um, after we are able to do that one. Just so that you guys know, um, every time we do something to one of them, there's a cause and a, an effect, right? So we raise a weir here, and then we see something else happening somewhere else down the line. So CSO number eight, we actually have not overflowed this year, which is, the that's a first for us, um, and we believe it's because of uh, some of the other changes we've made to the weirs down the line that it's not allowing it to get to that level um, over at that CSO structure. Um, one of the interesting things about this in the previous slide for me is just uh, the timeline. Uh, is it, am I correct in thinking from these slides that we will achieve the goal of CSO 
full separation by fiscal year 41? That's that's what we intend. Mm -hmm. um, and once once we get the, the flow monitors in, we'll have a better idea of, and able to do a couple of these these projects right off of uh, the bat, like this, the sewer sag, we'll have a little bit more uh, analytical yeah. data to really put a good grasp. But in. that's our current but estimate. But yeah, that is our, um, our current plan and our estimate of when we can um, take make sure that we can eliminate all the CSOs. Um, we do also feel that we can do it a little bit faster, but we want to be conservative sure. in our estimates, uh, sure. both fiscally and just uh, we don't there might be some other complications that uh, arise that we are not aware of yet. Um, if the fiscal uh, problems were disappeared in some way, like if we found, uh, is it uh, six, six and a half million dollars um, somewhere else, how quickly could we do it in terms of the work itself? Is that more like uh, a 10-year plan instead of a 20? I mean, I know this is total speculation, so you can tell me to back off. <laughs> well, so there's just some unknowns. Uh, like we went into talking about um, the steam curing of, of that pipe. Uh, we were very hopeful that that was going to be our solution. Um, there's a couple other things that we're looking at that are potentially really good alternatives. Um, but without knowing how successful some of these practices are going to be, it's a little hard to, to put a, a pinpoint answer on some of them. Um, the hope is that we can start doing bigger projects, you, um, you know, a mile at a time rather than a thousand, a couple thousand feet at a time. And uh, if, that, if that is occurring, we would see it speed up, speed up tremendously. I have now. Are some of these tied in with road projects? Or can they be done independent of any road repairs? Um, I'm not sure. If we if we do the lining project, then that, that, that does not need to be. Um, if we're doing full replacement, um, like Clarendon Avenue, then we do like to tie them in with with the paving. So. It's not in your map, but at one point I thought Tom mentioned something down at the bottom of East State hitting Main. And right. that, that I thought doing that one had to do with the bridge. It does, yep. But, okay, so that's why I was thinking there's some that are tied to projects that are roads. Right. But you don't even have that one on your map. Or I'm missing it's, it. It's not an overflow point. Okay. What it is is it's a combined system. So um, Right, it's a combined system. Yep. But it's so not all, of the, all the stormwater in East State ties back into the sewer system, mm -hmm. and that contributes to the overflows but okay. it's not an actual overflow point. Okay. And the problem is we don't have a storm outfall that can carry that volume of water, so we have to put a new one in when the bridge is rebuilt, the Rialto Bridge on State Street. Right, okay, that's what I thought. It just wasn't mentioned here. Thank you. We're also kind of uh, brainstorming some other creative ideas about whether if we can't get it to the Rialto Bridge, uh, how we might be able to still achieve that same, um, that same goal. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm like total broken record tonight. So you mentioned like 100 year rain events, like knowing that those are not gonna be 100 year rain events or like the, what was a 100 year rain event could become 10 year rain events. Like what are we planning to and is, is the system being built for a long term view of like changing precipitation patterns or are you, just how is that being kind of considered? Uh, so part of our goal is to really increase that capacity, which would more translate into like a 50-year storm. Uh, so when, when I'm talking about getting flow to the plant, um, we're really looking at making sure that we can take all of that, you know, so that we're looking at 100% we can get all of the 50 years. It just may be a few um, extreme storms that that are that remain, which is why we have that flow reduction and or treatment. Um, in case that we're not able to to tackle it uh, with the change in weather and climate. The other part of it is, um, you know, heavier rain events are more um, 
um, they contribute to overflows more if, from in uh, direct inflow. So like catch basins on the street that go straight to the sewer system or roof drains that go straight to the sewer system. Uh, our plan is to really eliminate all of those so that you're not so affected by rain events. Um, in that case, it becomes more uh, groundwater levels and, uh, and the sewer pipes that are, don't have tight gaskets in them to, to keep the water out. Um, and that ties back to the sewer master plan where as we replace our old sewer pipes, um, that component will also be eliminated. So I think we will be, by not having direct inflow anymore, that we're gonna be, have some protection from that, um, those heavier rain events. So, yeah. so just looking through your timeline, I know this is like this is actually your your next slide. Maybe I I'm, I don't want to stop you if you have more to say about. No, yeah. we'll let you guys guide the conversation. <laughs> I think we've told you what we came here to tell you, so Fair enough. we'll just answer your questions. So I find this timeline very helpful, uh, just to think about you know how like all the the monitoring and the testing that needs to go into figuring out what needs to be done or what sort of the next steps are. Um, but if uh, so we've got some, some citywide things that happen um, uh, over, you know, the, sort of the next, uh, you know, seven years or so. And then, but it looks to me as though the... N uh, the next one is 10 years. Well, or that, so the, the next one to be addressed, more or less, uh, it's, a little, it's a little funny because you've got, you've got it sort of chunked, right? So all the CSO number ones are together. So... But then we've also got some 2020 to 2022 um, deadlines, not, de not deadlines, but you know timelines anyway for um, CSO number eight and number nine. Um, so does that? I guess my my question is, um, do um, so we're at six CSOs basically right now. Um, it's going to take us a little while to figure out how to to eliminate or some time and some money to eliminate the next set, I suppose. Um, when do you anticipate that we may have uh, mitigated sort of the next one or the next few? Is that a fair question? Yeah, it is a fair question. Yeah. Uh, I'm hopeful that eight is done, okay. but I'm not Ooh, uh, already already done because we haven't had we've hit uh, up to upwards of seven million gallons uh, to the plant this year, and it's not uh, had an overflow event. Um, but I'm not sure that we're there yet. Um, so I would say that the the really the biggest thing on this list is in between the year of 2022 is that really that first project that sewer sag on State Street. Um, I think we're going to see a lot of changes after that project has a, has occurred. Um, I don't know, like I was saying before, it's hard to put in a really mm -hmm. definitive answer on what year is the first one going to be eliminated and then after that, which one is the next one to be eliminated and, and so on because they're all connected. Mm -hmm. We have a very flat system. There's almost no pitch between the plant and back here. Um, like maybe I think a foot of elevation or maybe two feet in between from like here at City Hall all the way down to the plant. So, you know, we're, we're running slopes at point zero 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 one feet per feet. It's, uh, so it's just, a, it's a little hard um, because it's a whole system that you have to and also the, the flow monitors that we're looking to install, that's actually going to measure the volume that is being discharged right now. We have to report a volume, um, but it's estimated because we have no way to measure it. So by having that data of actually quantifying the volume um, in relation to a rainfall event will allow us to you know, better answer your question in a, in a couple of years. Fair enough. Uh, sort of, I feel like my understanding of CSOs is shifting a little bit actually because of this presentation, which I think is a good thing. But my, uh, so if we make it through the year and eight does not overflow, um, just that effectively means that it's no longer a combined sewer water overflow point. Is that more or less true? Because it, it, to me, until it's, it's like, physically it's still blocked off, like it is still an overflow point. It's still an overflow. It just didn't have any events this year. Okay, so that's how the that state mean, would look at it. Does that mean that you would not do anything to it, or 
um. that mm, you could just close it up. You could just like seal that off and it'd be fine. Yeah, I'd be reluctant um, until we actually get the data that I was just referencing. Okay. Okay. That's helpful. Jack. Thinking in terms of uh, budgeting, I assume this is like the uh, water master plan, which is that all these uh, expenditures are uh, projected to come out of uh, revenues in the uh, in the sewer system. Yeah. And uh, so the new financial assistance we've gotten for the uh, for the plant does that potentially increase the capacity to uh, the revenue capacity to de devote to this well that's why I wanted that on the agenda to talk to you guys about tonight I can I can do that in five minutes if you want to just <laughs> go there right now <laughs> okay you're being time yeah. <laughs> um, so so the master plan of the of the sewer master plan was based around a three and a half million dollar debt service for the plant upgrade um, I think three years ago um, when we got with uh, ESG um, the project grew to 16.75 million dollar project um, we were looking at major uh, rate increases if we didn't get any grant assistance um, so this having this grant money now essentially you know it Interestingly, it brings the level of debt service back down, almost back to exactly to that three and a half million dollar debt um, when you factor in the guaranteed savings um, from ESG. I think we're actually going to we're going to pass that a little bit, um, but conservatively, it's almost identical. So we're back on master plan debt service. Again, this is very similar to the water. If you wanted to accelerate um, sewer overflow elimination, you would have to increase the rate of sewer ratepayers to achieve that um, so I and that's that was really the gist of that of that presentation is or that discussion is to just let you all know we're back on track now that, that we don't have to do these major rate increases that we were um, concerned that we might have to yeah. and the plan that we came up with was really based around uh, not having any increases any additional increases uh, we realized that uh, increasing the tax rate is not uh, something that we don't really want to do. Uh, so we've made really every effort to uh, keep it within our means. Um, but to be clear, the, the just so there's no misunderstanding, the, the plan calls for us to increase the rates 1% over inflation each year. Yes. So, so there are rate increases, but that we're staying within that plan. Oh, the other part of the the funding is or the project is we we did um, we had a second plant improvement project planned for ten years out. Um, we're doing all of that work now, so in ten years there is going to be a surplus funding available in the sewer fund um, because we're not going to have to do as much. There still are going to be a few plant needs, so the plant will need some work, but it's not going to be as significant as what's structured in the master plan. So that is an important distinction that in 10 years, because we're doing so much work up front, we are going to have um, some flexibility in sewer funding. Any other questions? Is there any action of this required now, or is this just informational? Super. Just, and just a reminder that, first of all, these are all important topics. But second of all, when we did our strategic plan, beginning of the year you had asked to be briefed on the finances of the plant and CSO and the, that so yeah. didn't just show up by accident no, well wonderful thank you and um, I, I think we still have time to talk through the water resource recovery facility if, if uh, yeah any, any disagreement on that so no. that half an hour before we hit 10 <laughs> Thank you so much on this part. And uh, I assume you don't have any slides for this portion. No, I don't Okay.
right. So Bill commented on this earlier, but it is a discussion item. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for the recognition. I appreciate that. Um, couldn't have done it without Todd. Um, he's a, a great resource. It's been a great resource. Um, so just to summarize how this funding works, um, we, our first pool of money, um, as we draw down um, payments, uh, our first pool of money is actually from the State of Vermont Pollution Control Grant. Um, and that's through the Facilities Engineering Division of the state, through ANR. Um, that's a $2.3 million grant. That is um, uh, basically because um, the facility is going to provide some regional um, support for um, treating waste. It's not just for Montpelier users. I think the state looks at that. It's, um, it's specific to solids handling, that grant. Um, and so as we draw down funds, USDA requires that we first use outside grant funding. So that'll be the first um, pot of money that's used up. Um, the second component is there's about $11.8 million um, that we will be borrowing for the project still. That is going to be financed through USDA at a, a maximum interest rate of 2.75%. All of our projections for rate increases and everything were based on a 3.5% increase or um, interest rate. So it's a, that that alone is a significant difference, just having that, you know, 1% or almost 1% difference. And the other benefit of USDA is um, if the if the prevailing rate um, decreases, they will actually drop that to even lower potentially. So there's that. That will be the highest we'll get. That could be lower. Um, and then the third piece is the just under $2.6 million um, dollar grant from the USDA. Um, again, I think a, a big part of it is the, the regional component that, that this project is really helping to support the Clean Water Act. Um, you know, um, we are, we actually just had a meeting this week with the engineering firms and um, we've done some tweaks to the design and we're actually going to be able to um, take a little bit more waste than we had projected by separating the septage waste, so uh, you know, when people pump out their septic tanks at their house, we're going to be able to send that straight to dewatering, keep it out of the digesters where the methane's produced, um, and so that frees up quite a bit of capacity. Um, our, our choke points are like tankage at the plant. Um, the other piece that that allows us to do is, um, and this is getting a little bit out of the financials, but I know there's probably some interest in phase two of the of what we're going to do with the gas um, again separate from these financials but just to just a point uh, since I'm kind of heading down that road um, by separating the food waste from the septage waste we potentially could qualify for um, a, a higher standard offer rate for power production um, right now it's looking like potentially even 20 cents a kilowatt hour which is which is really good. So that's another reason we sort of um, made this design change. There'll be some, you know, change orders associated with it to the project, a little bit of more cost, but um, well worth it, in, in our opinion. Um, so the other part I wanted to talk about was just like I just mentioned is we're back on steady state. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we don't have you know tons of cash to go um, fixing CSOs right off. But uh, as I mentioned, in ten years, <clears throat> we're going to be ahead of the game because we've done so much work now. So, uh, it is a really great thing for the sewer fund for the city. Um, we're all really excited about um, you know the doors that's going to open us up in the future. Questions. Where are we at with um, thoughts on what to do with the excess uh, generated gas? So um, MIAC is involved with this. Uh, I've had some discussions with them as well as with ESG. Um, really three options we're looking at. One is uh, CHP, combined heat and power. So um, you know, a methane generator would require some gas cleaning equipment. And um, you um, re uh, recover the heat off the engine of the generator, so you can use that for hot water or building heat potentially. Um, that's if we get the if we do qualify for the 20 cent a kilowatt 
uh, power production rate, um, that's probably going to be the most economical solution. And of course, um, probably the best um, uh, for net zero goals. Um, one of the other options is uh, direct sale of methane. If you clean, or scrub the gas, the methane gas, um, it's essentially natural gas. And there is a transfer station basically right across Dog River Road um, that potentially we could wholesale uh, natural gas to that, and then they would offtake it. Um, I'm not sure they're under new ownership. There's a little bit less interest than there was under the previous owners, but it's still something we, we want to uh, look into a little more. Um, and then the third is biosolids drying. So a big, you know, a big component of the cost of running the plant is disposing of the solids after you dewater it. There's a lot of trucking associated with that. There's a lot of disposal costs that all goes to the landfill. If you dry it, uh, it can be a fertilizer grade um, material. So you don't necessarily have to bring it to the landfill. We could potentially give it away. Um, there's testing associated with that. So those are the, the three that we're really going to sort of look into the financials of. Um, I wonder about the um, feasibility of drying it for being a f soil additive um, if it's got, if we're also taking leachate um, from Coventry. Does that end up, that doesn't restrict uh, what it can be used for? Um, well, you'd have to uh, do testing on it. So the, this is called, um, a class A, which has to meet a variety of um, testing parameters to qualify as a fertilizer grade material. Um, the, the leachate does not go through the solid stream of the plant, it goes through the liquid stream. Okay. So, so it's not actually dewatered, so it wouldn't be directly so much contributing. Uh, there be, there's a little bit of settlement where it goes through the tanks. Um, that does, and then whatever settles out does go through the process, but it's a fairly minimal amount mm -hmm. um, so I mean that would be something we'd look at if that is the alternative we can you know we could make that decision if um, if it was the best choice to eliminate leachate and that was actually causing a problem I don't expect that would be the case okay cool any other thoughts comments See yeah. How mellow we get. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Now's the time. <laughs> well, um, I think. It, yeah. I think it says a lot to all the material you've given us over time, besides what you gave us tonight, and just the way you ask questions and provide information. So, you've done well, or you would be having more questions. Mm -hmm. Happy to answer them. <laughs> <laughs> I really, I'm so grateful um, for all that you do and uh, for giving us all this this information. This is really helpful. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Okay. Awesome. All right. So um, we have made it through, and it's not even ten. <laughs> so we're on to council reports. Uh, Donna, you up for starting? I am if you're sure. <laughs> you want me to be shorter, but uh, whatever. okay. It's all good. So. CV Fiber gave us a report, and I would like us to invite our reps to come in and talk to us. And I mentioned it to Ken Jones, who was here earlier, because we haven't heard from them, and I think we really need to understand their budget and their money. Uh, it's a lot of money uh, that's coming in the pike, so I would appreciate that. And I want everyone to know Complete Streets Committee is going onto the lights and the darkness. And in November, they're going to be distributing the LEDs that you wear on your arm or whatever for pedestrians, but also special lights for bikes. They're going to add another component for bicycles. And the uh, Montpelier, uh, Montpelier Transportation Infrastructure Committee is really interested in the Ordinance 10, and they're coming with some really creative ideas. I'll give you a draft out early of the, the packet of, so that you can actually look at some of their ideas. And likewise, Complete Street is sending some things. And uh, just a be warning, they're really treating almost all mobility that's not your legs almost the same. It's really interesting. And I myself am going to send something out about the dog ordinance. You may not know, but we define a nuisance dog only if they bark, howl, whine for continuous period of 20 minutes. And I've had a neighborhood with about six neighbors talking about a dog that never goes 20 minutes, but does it often. So I'm going to be looking at adding some language that a nuisance 
could also be defined as somebody, a dog that's chronic, persistent, barking, howling, whining, several times throughout the day, several times throughout the week. So just heads up. Thank you. This is your plan to win friends. Uh. Um, <laughs> well, it's an important I, topic. The people who are coming, my voters, yes, are <laughs> asked. Yeah. But there's the other group. I uh, just want to thank Bill and Chief Fakos. I attended the press conference today, and obviously a very sensitive subject. Um, but I, I think when the state's attorney did run down the list of events, um, you could tell it provided some closure for some folks in the community, I think. So I um, was really proud that Bill and uh, Tony represented us at that, so thanks very much. Um, much lighter note, but uh, I, I don't know if anybody got a chance to ride the pebble thing around town there. Uh, I told Hanif I would make a pitch for it. It was like me getting a clown car, the thing was so small. Uh, but, but no, it's pretty fascinating. Uh, I, I think uh, Sustainable Montpelier is doing a lot of good work, so I'd encourage you to take a ride if you can in the last few days here. So, like, I got the contact info for that. Let's wait. Um, so, let's see. Uh, as you may have been able to tell, the Homelessness Task Force continues to chug right along. Uh, our new Assistant City Manager, Cameron Niedermeyer, has been a great help there. Thanks, Cameron. Um, and we have uh, heard from Good Samaritan that uh, the warming shelter is on schedule to open on November 1st. They have it staffed. Um, and also, uh, another way has agreed and worked with Good Samaritan to open their space for further hours. So uh, for the people who can take advantage of the warming shelter and another way services, we are uh, about to open that up and, and uh, it's, I think, good progress. Um, on a completely different subject, uh, my partner Kate and I are having some tree work done uh, to take down some ash trees. We haven't heard about the emerald ash borer for a little while here, so I thought I would bring it back up. Um, uh, it's both sad and uh, encouraging in a lot of ways to see some of those trees come down uh, that would otherwise, I think, have come down in a much less controlled way uh, at an inconvenient time. So encourage everyone, if you can, please think now about tree work for ash trees. Um, Were these city trees or? These are on our own property. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the Wood Gallery, I've been really enjoying myself uh, on Tuesday evenings for the past four weeks teaching a drawing class. I don't know if my students have enjoyed themselves, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> most of them kept coming, so whatever. Um, I'm going to be giving a brief talk about that class next Wednesday uh, at 7 o'clock at the front gallery, 7 in the evening. Um, and I really had so much fun at the wood. Um, I'd like to try to run the class again at some point in the spring. So um, the wood gallery is great. Everyone should go there. Uh, I've really enjoyed myself. Uh, and finally, I'll be at Baguito's tomorrow morning, 8.30 to 9.30, if anyone has anything they would like to talk to me about. Thanks. Uh, Jack. Just a couple of things. One is that some of us were at the grand opening for the uh, Taylor Street uh, Transit Center and uh, apartments on Friday. It was great. There was there were a lot of people there. A good representation from uh, our entire congressional delegation was represented, including Peter Welch being there in person. Um, <coughs> the space looks great. The apartments are really nice. Uh, about 10 of them are already occupied. Um, the whole thing was excellent. And uh, what I heard funders say is that one of the key pieces of the puzzle to make a project like that happen was the uh, city funds that came from the housing trust fund. So. Um, even though it's not a huge amount of money, it was what we put into that uh, project was 
vital to making uh, making sure it got uh, completed. Um, also, we had the first meeting of the uh, of the committee to investigate the future of Main Street Middle School on uh, Monday night, and it's a long-term study for what uh, what should be done. We'll be meeting once a month through 2000, through the end of 2020, and uh, we'll just see how that develops. But it's, we had a tour of the building. We had, uh, it looked very much the way it looked when, uh, when my kids were uh, going to that school uh, <coughs> 20 years ago now, maybe, something like that. Um, and there's, the work is cut out for us. And we do have, uh, not only do we have representatives of, uh, of the school board and the neighborhood, we have uh, one teacher and uh, one student at the middle school on the committee. Um, only two things. Um, one, I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge, I think I've had um, one call from a constituent talking about an issue and he went, out of his way to kind of thank the city staff and how great they've been to work with, even though it's been a really challenging issue. And I think hearing the Murray Hill folks acknowledge that. So just taking a moment to say kudos to Bill and the team at and the, working for the city, who it's it's just, you know, it's great to hear such positive feedback, even people working through really difficult, challenging issues. So um, that's, that's great to hear, nice work. Um, only other thing, assuming Anne will share some of the energy um, issues that are going on. Um, the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee um, continues to work, and we have been, as I mentioned, last council meeting, we've been talking to some folks who are experts and have worked with other cities, for example, on how you do this work effectively. So we're planning to come um, back to you all with some more details of what that kind of work could look like. So I really look forward to that conversation um, in the coming weeks. Uh, all right, I have a few things. Um, one is, uh, <clears throat> so this Friday at 4.30, we've got the art unveiling uh, for the uh, the art at Taylor Street. Um, so I'm pretty excited about that. So 4.30, come check that out uh, this Friday. Uh, and then um, the following Friday uh, is the opening for the uh, Shared Use Paths of Bowena Bee. I'm trying to get my, you know, uh, my mouth acclimated to saying that, and uh, I think I've got it. So uh, it's not that hard you know, if you practice just a little bit. Keep um, saying it again. <laughs> yeah, see Bowena See, right, see Anyway, uh, so that's at uh, Bar Hill. Uh, I'm still back up. The art unveiling will be at Taylor Street, uh, but I think there's a reception uh, at um, Bar Hill afterwards, and then um, the uh, opening of the bike path, I mean, shared use path, um, we'll be at Bar Hill. There's a ride prior. Um, yes, well, question? You mentioned a 215 at, on the path, like, and <coughs> then Bar Hill at 315 in, in, the, yeah. uh, in the release from the Complete Streets group. That's what they released. A yes. 215 and a 315. Yeah, 215 is the ride or something. Um, yep, and so we'll uh, at least have a little more, you know, like talking ceremony or whatever at, at, at 315. So I'm looking forward to that. Should be great. Uh, and uh, I actually didn't have much to say about the energy news. We're still, at least as far as the, um, the ordinance uh, language goes, we're, um, we've got a draft and we're working on it. And um, it's, it's, yeah, we're going to need to do a little digging on that language, and that's okay. Hopefully we'll have a draft for you soon. But we are actually hoping to have uh, an item on the agenda, at least at some point in the near future. I'll just give you all an update um, as to sort of what, um, with more particulars about where we're at and the, um, the, just getting some of the background um, of what the, the language may do. Um, and what, what's been done in other cities, et cetera. So um, that's sort of upcoming. So hopefully we can get that on the agenda at some point. Uh, and I think that is, uh, that is it for me. Um, 
Yeah. yeah. Yes. Can I ask you about the regional compost group you worked with a little bit on? Um, actually, that's a, that's a great question. So um, my, <laughs> we sort of had stopped meeting, unfortunately, which I will I will blame myself for oh, that. Shame. I know. Um, but uh, Donna Barlow Casey had been on that uh, committee just coming as a citizen at that point. So I'm hoping to. to <laughs> I mean, I should probably have this conversation with her first, but my, my hope was, is that, uh, you know, we queen. can... Yeah, yeah, because we're going to need to... Um, well, I, I would like for us to start meeting again. Um, so it's still... On the yeah, section. and just so you know where we were at, uh, uh, another community in Vermont had uh, issued an RFP for what it would take to... Um, for someone to come up with a plan for what it would take to take their municipality to a, a, a municipal trash recycling compost um, system. And so we stole that uh, language and modified it for us, uh, for, you know, between Montpelier and Barrie. And we were um, sort of at the point of trying to um, uh, just modify that language. Uh, we were sort of in the middle of that process to see, you know, how, how should that look for us if we were going to hire someone to do a sort of a map for us as to what that would look like or what what it would take um, to make that happen. So anyway, does that that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. All right. That's it for me. Okay. Just a couple of things. Um, Cameron and I met with folks from Bar Hill uh, once again, uh, and also Vermont. Uh, the uh, River Conservancy about the, the river access that Bar Hill granted us as part of the development agreement. And so we had a nice conversation about how to move forward with that. I think there's going to be a lot of cooperation there. And they're, they're going to, I think VRC is going to take the lead on that since that's what they do best. And I think <clears throat> they're also uh, talking to us about developing a master plan for the whole river corridor. So the idea is there's going to be these access nodes like Confluence Park, like this one at Caledonia Spirits, like the ones at uh, like uh, Old Country Club Road, perhaps at the high school. And so we, we talked a little bit about having a consistent look and brand for those kind of things along the riverfront. So that was interesting. Uh, last week I was at the ICMA conference in Nashville, learned lots, met lots of people, got some good ideas. Appreciate always being able to attend that. Um, Donna had saw me today and asked for an update on the parking garage. I don't have anything specific about that other than that we are still in court. Um, fi you know, filings are all being made. I think the next uh, steps that will happen will be decisions about which issues remain in the case and which parties remain in the case. Uh, and on the Act 250 side, um, basically whether this whether we are required to be in Act 250 or not. Um, you know, municipal projects are actually exempt. We went in because the determination was that the the hotel and the, the garage work together, but that's still being sorted out. So once those preliminaries get set, then there will be you know content hearings on whatever is left to be uh, dealt with. Don't know the timing on all of that, and of course we continue to look at all of our options. Uh, let's see, anything else? Cameron's been great in her three weeks. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. Um, <laughs> And we are in the process of looking at finance director applications as they come in. So anybody know anybody that's good with numbers, send them our way. <laughs> Steve, you interested? <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, well, I think that's it. So uh, without objection, we will adjourn. And it is 9.59. <laughs>